Good morning, you're very welcome along to Wednesday morning's OTBAM. It's Owen and Kenny here with you for the morning until around 9.15 this morning and plenty coming up for you between now and then. We're going to be reflecting on Liverpool's scoreless draw with Bayern Munich in the Champions League last night. We're going to chat a little bit about Manchester City tonight as well and probably look ahead to Liverpool against Manchester United this Sunday. Also this weekend, we were just saying before we came on air, it's one of the biggest sporting weekends of the year so far. Plenty of Six Nations, we're going to start building up to that and also a big interview coming your way a little bit later on as well with Will Fleury. He's an Irish MMA fighter who's on the Bellator card in Dublin. He's had a pretty interesting 12 months and he's got some very good views on defeat and the line between uh, entitlement and confidence when it comes to combat sports. So it's very interesting. It's coming up your way around 9am this morning. Kenny Cunningham, a very good morning to you. Morning, Alan. How are you? Uh, all good, all good. You're still not the Euro Millions winner? Oh. Or, or at least I, I think so. I you haven't mentioned the, anything about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't never get that kind of bit of a jealous uh, jolt in my body when I... I hear that news. I, you know, good luck to him, but I would have been so much happy. Or her, yeah, but it would have been so much. I was hoping it was going to be a syndicate. This broke last night. Joe was getting uh, very excited at the prospect of someone winning 150 million pounds. But for me, it's like oh, potentially like disastrous uh, for any one individual that type of money. I'd love to see it spread evenly, like a syndicate of about ten, spread around the country. Mm. Donegal, down in your native Kerry, <laughs> Cork, that money spread all around the country for me would be absolutely fantastic. But I can't even go there. 150, well, 175, uh, 70 million euros. We could afford that property in Kerry we were talking about. That little, Down in uh, Kenmare, yeah, we were yeah, going to buy a house. Yeah, the house share we were talking about. Why don't we forget about the house share? Yeah, we can each buy a house ourselves. <laughs> uh, the thing about it, Kenny, is you're the exact type of person who would win 175 million euro and tell nobody about it. You would still come in and talk football with us every morning. Oh, I'm a very private person, as you well know. <laughs> uh, I only to tell people what they need to know. No, I couldn't even, I can't even get me, me, me head around that, to, to be honest with you. Mm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even know where I'd, I'd start. Easy to say, like, it wouldn't uh, change me. Some people might say, oh, what's the point? What a waste. Like, it's not, if 150 million isn't going to change your life, what's the, what's the point? But I don't know. I'd be a little bit, there'd be a little bit of trepidation there when that check hit the, hit the mat, came through the, uh, the letterbox. I'd have to admit, I might have to phone you for a bit of advice <laughs> on how to spend it. <laughs> I'm sure you could recommend a few European destinations for me to... 100% we'll go on a road travel. trip. I know you're a well-traveled travel man. <laughs> Uh, we do want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, high standards. I think that's a, a smooth enough segue this morning because uh, there's some interesting quotes uh, about Roy Keane uh, from Andy Reid yesterday on TalkSport and also this idea uh, of Johnny May talking about comparing this England team to the great Chelsea side previously because John Terry's been in with the rugby team uh, and he's been giving them a few talks and he sees a few comparisons because of the leadership core in this English rugby team and the standards that they're bringing in training. And, and Andy Reid was talking about kind of a similar enough Thing about Roy Keane yesterday saying that he's demanding and sometimes people who get intimidated by that they need to have a look at their own personality which uh, I guess coming from your perspective it's something that you probably agree with uh, in terms of high standards in training. Uh, uh, yeah, generally speaking I, I think that's uh, fair but I'd, I'd have to say I, I didn't experience that uh, throughout my career uh, when I played even from my own point of view uh, especially when you get maybe a little bit older um, you'd have to kind of manage yourself a little bit and maybe the last few years of my uh, club career, I found in terms of training, I probably wouldn't have trained with the same intensity that I did when I was a little bit younger. You get to know your body a, a little bit more. Mm. So you almost have to manage yourself a little bit on during the course. And I, I wouldn't say I've got a, I would have got a reputation, but there would have been occasions during training where you just get up and obviously prepare yourself for training to go. But very quickly during training, you, almost, you think... Look, I'm not physically, I don't quite feel I can really push myself where I need to be. So it always, you almost drop down again, manage yourself, and there'll be a little bit of lads, maybe a little bit of derision from the players. Any chance? Bloody hell, boom, boom, boom. But so for me, I wouldn't be ultra critical in that respect. I think the certain players maybe have to manage themselves a little bit more. But I think the general principle in terms of, you know, commit yourself to your training and the intensity levels uh, have to be right, I think is fair. But I think that's the, generally speaking, that would be broadly how most uh, players, kind of professionals, no matter what kind of sport you're in, would approach uh, their training. So, um, yeah, I don't know, Reedy really mentions uh, Roy, I think. Mm. I mean, I would have only experienced Roy. I, 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 Sunderland, certainly the year I was there, yeah, certainly there would have been that, well, let's train, let's train well. Yeah. 
Uh, but generally speaking, that would have been the ream at uh, whatever club he would have been at. Yeah, he says Roy's demanding, he demands high standards and you need to be mentally strong to work with him. I don't see any problem in that. People say you can't treat players like that anymore, but I don't see that. Can you not demand high standards? You can, day in, day out. Pass the ball properly. If there is a 10-yard pass, do it properly. If there is a tackle to be made, do it properly. I don't see anything wrong with that. If people can't deal with that, they need to work on their per- personalities. Uh, and he talks about being in two or three squads with Martin took over and it's a different dynamic uh, for Roy not being the manager. I kind of agree yeah. with him. Like, there, there is yeah, nothing wrong well, with I wouldn't agree totally. To, but I understand where Reedy's coming from he's talking uh, well to some extent I'd say from a bygone age a an age which is actually gone mm. or from a coach and, and there you are being Roy Keane's captain <laughs> so he's not screaming at me <laughs> 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 yeah I'm looking at Roy you know, here we go again but no but I, I think you, ha- you have to be a chameleon you have to change your approach if, if I think Andy's talking about maybe as a as a as a coach, uh, as a manager, you, you have to take a different type of approach. If that approach isn't working with players, that kind of a little bit more aggressive, uh, demanding uh, approach to your players, which back in the day was pretty much accepted uh, by players, and you know that maybe they weren't as uh, flaky. Potentially, some play- people might say as, as p- players today, but you have to modify your approach. It's no good enough saying oh, you got to be able to take it. If players are switching off, they won't accept it. You know, you have, you have managers nowadays and coaches w- uh, will tell you that they they've had to change their approach in terms of uh, dealing with players. So, was there like an intense training session going on at that point, and you two boys are just sitting it out? <laughs> leadership and training. <laughs> this is what I'm uh, talking about. You get to a certain, you get to a certain. I've got like a, almost a defensive uh, uh, pose on there, haven't I? I've got my knees up against my chest as if. Uh, Roy's going to uh, physically attack me, maybe sling a ball in my direction, but... Well, like, it's uh, a body language expert would have a field day with that picture. Like, you are, you, what, are you intimidated what would be your by Roy that? What would, be your, what would be your take on that? That, that you're a little bit guarded, that uh, Roy is, uh, <laughs> is, gla- is about to glare at you, about to, to tell you off. <laughs> well, why wouldn't he be? He looks a, little, a lot more calmer there, uh, Roy. And Roy, best player in the world, uh, uh, why not? I've never seen that photo, actually. It's not a bad little, it's not a bad little photo, yeah, is it? Yeah, it's from April 97. 97 yeah. is that right, yeah, yeah. But that's what I'm saying. I, I would, um, I'd cut a little bit. Some uh, managers would, you know, demand, people thought you have to demand certain levels in terms of intensity, quality has to be up there. But that wasn't always the case. And I saw it with other players as well in terms of not particularly good trainers. Uh, in, in, you'd almost say going through the motions. Uh, in today's game, would be un- unacceptable in terms of how they approached uh, their training. But... Come Saturday, when it mattered, the switch would go on mm. and you'd get that level of performance. And managers, some managers actually ex- accepted that uh, from players. And other players would have accepted it because they understood when it really mattered come game time, um, they'd be on their game. So there would be that, some players, there would be that type of drop off. Well, like but the it, mentality's changed. As a player, as a teammate of that player, is it a bit harder to accept? I guess from a manager's perspective, it's fine for them, but you're putting in dogs work yeah. and they potentially are getting away with a little bit more no I must admit no I, I, I understand what you're, uh, you're saying but it, it was accepted this, this is the point that I'm making I saw it as a young pro myself older pros when I first uh, came into the game maybe that little bit of drop off that lack of intensity you know just kind of you know feeling their way through sessions and no they weren't criticised for I never remember looking at these players and thinking that's an absolute disgrace I'm doing more uh, running than him it was, it, it was just accepted so long as when it, when it mattered uh, come the game at the weekend they kind of stepped they stepped up and put, um, put a per, f- performance in and that might be considered kind of old school mentality and, and it probably was whereas today it's a lot different the, the game has changed it's kind of um, moved on to an extent people talk about you know raising the bar you know the small percentage gain the margins and we, which is a good thing uh, generally speaking so that part of the game maybe has 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 changed significantly and, and for the better I'd have to say uh, generally but yeah it's an it, it's an interesting concept but yeah, I, I, it's an easy thing to say in terms of demanding from players and even other players, even older pros uh, only accept at a certain level of performance intensity to the training. But but still, you speak to coaches nowadays when the game, they talk about players, how careful, how sensitive they can be to criticism, even in terms of how you speak to people, in terms of the tone uh, of your language. you know, And that's all part of coaching, good management, pe- people skills. And you have to modify your approach. Now, I know Andy's saying, my way or the highway, but if that's the case, you're gonna be you're gonna be on the highway. You're mm. you, you're, you're gonna leave your job 
because the players aren't going to accept you. They're going, they're going to switch off and ultimately that's going to cost you your job. So what are you, got? are you going to keep repeating that every club that you go to with the same end result and very they're going to be shown the door because you're going to lose, lose the confidence of the players or you're going to have to modify and tailor your approach a little bit as long as it... As much as it kind of galls you a little bit uh, inside, against goes it goes against all your natural instincts, and I understand what Andy's saying. But you have to do it. You have to kind of uh, modify your approach in the modern game. Yeah, for sure. It certainly seems that way. And we're going to stick with sporting psychology and attitude for the time being because, as I say, we're speaking uh, to Will Fleury a little bit later on and he is fighting on the Bellator card at the Three Arena this weekend, uh, which is, of course, on Sky Sports. It's on Saturday night. And in his last outing, he lost his undefeated record in pretty brutal style. And he spoke to us about the fine line between confidence and arrogance. We just want to play this clip. You're telling us how you're going to beat him. Uh, for people who might have missed that fight in Rome last year, tell us what happened. Um, I got knocked out in the first round, basically. I felt like my preparation had been very good, but I do feel like I let myself down on the night, just with my attitude. How so? so? I kind of felt like I was entitled to win that fight. You know, I did, I looked at him, I saw his skill set, I was thinking like, I'm a way better martial artist than this guy. And this is just like a celebration of how good a martial artist I am. So... Look, the game doesn't work like that and life doesn't work like that. You get out there and you take every opportunity that comes your way. I didn't feel vicious on the night. I didn't feel that fear, that kind of switched on, you know, primal instinct to just get rid of the guy. I grew up watching Monster Rugby and, you know, I kind of love that attitude of like, it's just the honesty of your effort mm -hmm. and the honesty of like, you going out there and putting it all on the line and that's what's going to get you over there. But there is a psychology within just being like, no, I'm better. I'm actually better than you and I can do things better than you can and I'm training in a better environment than you are and you know just what I do you won't be able to match there's a positivity within that but there is like you said there's like when does it become an entitlement yeah that full interview is coming your way a little bit later on and Kenny there is that fine line particularly in combat sports between oh, yeah, an, a maybe. necessary arrogance and an unnecessary entitlement I'm not sure if there's anything you can relate to there yourself N no <laughs> <laughs> well I don't think so we talk about constantly about crossover in terms of uh, sports I mean obviously individual sport uh, uh, as opposed to team sport for me is, is, always, is always difficult and, and you hear the comparison we spoke with just earlier before we came on now in terms of uh, uh, rugby in particular uh, football and even the uh, the game in particular so there's reasonable the comparisons there you can make in terms of the team environment but the mixed martial arts like made very interesting in terms of what he was saying I, I would imagine that mentality that he's speaking about in terms of yeah I, I'm better than you this kind of confidence not kind of uh, overconfidence I, I would I would think that it's no bad thing as long as it, it kind of doesn't deviate your focus you know that does, doesn't channel off into kind of an, an arrogance, you know what I mean? And in terms, of, and you kind of lose your focus because of it, then obviously it can become a little bit of a danger. I think maybe that's what he was alluding to. But in that particular type of sport, absolutely kind of brutal to some extent, as skilled as it is, I would, I would think that kind of mentality in terms of, yeah, I'm backing myself here, I'm prepared, I'm confident, I've had some chances, I'm better for you for the reasons that were, uh, were mentioned there. That can't be any, I think you almost need that. There can't be any kind of self-doubt of any sort, you know what I mean, in that, in that particular sport, I wouldn't have thought. I would have thought it would be the same for every sport. If you've actually got that sort of complex that you can actually achieve something that will help you defeat your opponents. That can only be a positive thing. I'm not sure. Like you obviously have to keep humility. It can, yeah, it, but that, that that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, is it is, as long as you yeah, if you can take a step away from that, and in terms of how you execute what you need to do, whether it's mixed martial arts or say individual part, where, uh, whatever it is, you don't let that kind of confidence, that overconfidence, I say, kind of uh, consume you, and and you kind of forget about the process involved and actually going out and doing what you need to do during the course of the fight or or whatever it is. Now, in a team sport for me, it's different because in a funny way, team sport is kind of hiding places. It gives you kind of hiding places playing with a team. Because I, I had, I know, obviously when your performances drop off, individual performance during the course of the game, you, you're, you're bailed out. The other players can kind of uh, bail you out. They, you, can get off, you can get off the hook. And, and I, I remember, particularly in the early part of my career, not having a huge amount of kind of self-confidence. That was, looking back, I didn't think about it at the time, but that probably was a problem for me in the early uh, part of my career. And I probably fought with it, not even the early part, for a large part uh, in my career in terms of a little bit of uh, self-doubt, uh, mm. low confidence. And I didn't think it was a bad thing, on 
because for me, it really kind of haunt me senses going into games in terms of focus has to be right, decision making, concentration levels have to be spot on. Because if not, I'm really going to get exposed here. Whether it was against coming up against a tricky winger, good pace, good tech ability, and I knew it, I knew I'd be in trouble if I wasn't really at it. So that kind of fear element that I know actually I'm not as good as this fella, but I'm really going to have to be switched on in terms of being able to cope with this. So so that that helps me in it, to to a certain extent. But in some respects, maybe it held me back a, a, a little bit as well. As in you thought that perhaps I'm not good enough to play at this level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe a little bit of that subconsciously. Like I said, I, I didn't overanalyze um, um, myself for a large, for a large part of uh, my career. Psychologists came in towards the tail end of my career. But I never really sat down in a 1v1 situation. I like to kind of group dynamic on occasion, sit down with, with the group and invariably maybe having a conversation if there was a psychologist, whoever it was in, in the room. But... Yeah, one to one. I never took the opportunity to speak to any psychologist one v one. Just kind of kept me, kept me distant. So yeah, no, I like I said, don't overanalyze. But maybe looking back, maybe think, well, why not? Why didn't you dip your toe in the water? Maybe have these kind of conversations. So other lads do it very privately, and kind of it, it kind of did help them in terms of a little bit of kind of self esteem, change their perception a little bit of themselves, and mm. all, all, all that type of thing. And I did see it benefit other players, but. I kind of, I don't know, it was a strange one. I just kind of, I, I kept my distance myself. So, yeah, maybe didn't help myself in some respects, but I'd still say that that kind of fear factor, which I had, and maybe a bit of low confidence at times, it helped me in another respect as well. Like, if you could turn back the clocks and you had to speak to the sports psychologist, what would you say to them about self-esteem and your, your confidence? No, I don't think it's not in terms of what I'd say, but just in terms of being a little bit more open-minded and listening to people that they had, maybe they would throw certain uh, things at you, well, think about this, uh, think about that. Just somebody coming from a different kind of uh, uh, perspective, you know, and maybe just, you know, just testing you a little bit, making you think about things uh, a little bit more. So you know, I look back and I think, well, maybe could it benefit, maybe, maybe it didn't, maybe I was a little bit closed off. Uh, to that type of thinking. And did so, that change over a period of time? No, it didn't. It didn't really. No, like I said, I never, I never went down uh, uh, that, that particular road. I kind of analysed my game to it, but on a technical level, mm. oh, and in terms of, right, what did I do today? How did I defend well? 1v1, defend me back post in possession, what I could have done better. That, but in terms of the actual uh, mindset, how I prepared myself, which you hear a lot about now in team sports, uh, football, even the the rugby, in particular, you mentioned there, the uh, the England team, Johnny May talking about the mindset, uh, the players, the individual mind, and you can even the gal lads. I listen to the the um, the gal lads talk, and you can tell you can tell that's a big uh, part of it. You know what's going on between between the years of individual players and the responsibility they're taking to make sure they're in the right place and. Apart from all their physical conditions, the sports science uh, side of things, just in terms of mentally being in the right place, and how positively they talk mm. about themselves, like as well, which is a good thing. I, I, I never had had that. I mean, I was very much talking it down. That's uh, even being a little bit self-critical. You know that type of thing. You talk yourself down. But how uh, severe would that have been? Like, cause some people can be very, very, very tough on themselves, and ultimately that just chips away the confidence a bit more. Yeah, maybe, maybe subconsciously uh, it does. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, but I, I never really went there. In all honesty, I, I literally parked that for pretty much all, uh, all, all of me, all of my career. So I don't look. It's, it's gone now. My career is gone. But it is interesting. I'm very interested when people hear uh, players in different sports, individual or team, just uh, there as well. People uh, talking about the subject. It, it is very interesting, and obviously individual players. Uh, gain great benefit from going down that that particular road, and is it is it significant? I think it can be overplayed in terms of the psychological preparation. People say it's everything going down the tunnel, and games are won and lost. I think it can be overplayed, but in but I think it is a still a significant factor in terms of your uh, preparation. Yeah, of course it is. Uh, let's tell you what's coming up on today's show. Here's the running order. So we're going to get into the sports pages four minutes ago. Actually, we we're a bit behind schedule. Then into the Champions League, we got Kenny's take on last night at Anfield at around quarter past eight. Will Flurry then. That clip we played, you'll be playing out two larger chunks of that at around half past eight this morning. And the sports news with Darren is coming your way at ten to nine. And then we'll finish up with a look ahead to the weekend's action. It is Italy against Ireland, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, Wales against England as well. But before that, we'll take a look at the back pages. And we are going to start with the Irish Independent this morning. And it's a picture of Mo Salah there reaching for a ball, which ultimately 
resulted uh, in a wide, I think, last night, that particular chance. It was Reds fire blanks uh, in Anfield stalemate, says the headline. And Henderson and Clear to boost Schmidt's Rome lock stock, says Rory O'Connor. So Ian Henderson has avoided any punishment for uh, uh, an alleged neck roll, I guess you could say, last week uh, in the Pro 14. And you've also got Sarri on brink amid wider Chelsea crisis, which is a story during the rounds in all of the sports pages this morning. Uh, he has survived for now, uh, but he's still very much uh, on the brink. And there are fears that Chelsea's plight could be made even uh, more difficult, regardless of who is head coach, as the club wait to see if Eden Hazard wants to join Real Madrid. FIFA hits the Blues with a transfer ban. UEFA bans thousands of their fans in the Europa League. And their battle with former head coach Antonio Conte goes to court. It's probably the most difficult period so far uh, in Roman Abramovich's reign. Uh, we move on to the Irish Times this morning. Uh, Gordon Darcy's column is Ireland need to park the Blues, rediscover their sense of fun and start playing some jazz while uh, on the front of their sports section it is uh, resilient Byron ensure Liverpool still have it all to do. Uh, Mo Salah there again pictured last night in between uh, two Bayern Munich defenders. Uh, the Times Ireland edition then this morning leads with the headline Mane blows Liverpool's big chance. And O'Brien says, move will not end Ireland career. So this is Sean O'Brien, obviously, speaking yesterday at Carton House about his move to London Irish. Says he expects to play for Ireland still after moving to London Irish. We'll ask, uh, we, we, like, we get takes on this as the, the show progresses, Kenny, but like we were speaking about this before going on air, this, uh, the double standard, I want to say, that exists between Johnny Sexton and the rest of Irish players is an interesting one. It's an understandable one, given how good Johnny Sexton is. Sean O'Brien uh, hasn't exactly ruled out the possibility that he's going to play for Ireland once again, while also being a London Irish player. Uh, and I guess the, the process of following this unwritten rule is kind of a case-by-case -case basis. But there's no suggestion at the moment that Farrell is going to, after taking over from Joe Schmidt, change any rules at all with yeah. regards to this. Yeah, I'd have a lot of sympathy for Sean O'Brien there. There's obviously reasons why he's uh, making the move. And uh, clearly, w uh, there's a financial one. He hasn't got a central contract, you mentioned, mm. from the Rugby Association. So I can understand the the offer from a club in England would be, uh, you know, he'd, he, he wouldn't turn it down. But it's such a shame, like, you know what I mean, to have to sacrifice potentially you know, your relationship with the international uh, team. Obviously, he's been, he's been a big member of the squad, huge amount of pride, I'd imagine, putting on the jersey, goes, goes without saying. So to have to kind of sacrifice that, I mean, I'd have a huge amount of, of, of sympathy for the player. And like you said, you know, if, uh, uh, a hardened rule in terms... I can understand it in terms of, look, you take a step away from the, the provinces, well, that, that's the end of it. And as long as you're pretty consistent with that, but obviously the exception of Johnny Sexton, Johnny Sexton, which I I understand in terms of the qualities which he which he possesses, but once you you know once you you start to realise that you start making the exceptions, the whole thing starts to fall apart a little bit. And it can it can breed a little bit of discontent. I, I I would assume amongst players to see an exception being made for one particular uh, player. And this isn't a criticism of Johnny Sexton uh, at all at all. And obviously he's back at Leinster at the moment, but. Once you start making exception for in the individual players, that, that that must be difficult for other players to to take. We're making a commitment to the promises. Maybe financially they could better themselves by going abroad to England, France. You know uh, better than me, but now that they're making the commitment to the province primarily because of their their international the relationship with the international team, how much they value that, and how much uh, they're committed to it. But then to start seeing the exceptions being made, that that must be a difficult one in terms of a little bit of a head wreck. For some of the players, maybe it isn't an issue. Mm. Maybe that's just me, maybe overplaying it. But I can understand the logic of it, and I think the the international team has benefited from it. Uh, own in terms of managing their kind of game time, and uh, you can see that in terms of the <clears throat> level of performance over the past couple of years from the team, which has been pretty much amazing. So there's clearly a logic uh, to it, which which I understand. But it, but once you draw a line in the sand and start making exceptions, that's 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 a dodgy road to go down. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if anybody actually comes out in the next couple of years and actually speaks out against it because nobody so far has, uh, seems to be any bit dissatisfied with that decision. Maybe just everybody accepts that it was the correct decision if you take everything on a case-by-case -case yeah. basis. But yeah, we'll get into those Sean O'Brien quotes a little bit later on as well. At the front page of the Irish Examiner sports section is Red Eye, Liverpool missing ruthless streak <laughs> in Anfield's uh, stalemate. And Donald Lenehan is saying springtime spring stutters. We'll stand to Ireland in World Cup cauldron, which seems to be the common theme over the past couple of weeks. And the back page of the Racing Post, then, finally, is Firing Blanks, City of Too Much Firepower for a shot shy Schalke. It's uh, Schalke against Manchester City in Gelsenkirchen tonight. It kicks off at 8 o'clock. And we'll preview a little bit of that later on as well. But first of all, you've got some of the tabloids. All oh, right, presumably. I'm not going to repeat. Now, you've separated these Liverpool. papers. I'm not going to start repeating headlines, <laughs> am I? 
<laughs> no pressure here. I think the quote from uh, obviously Liverpool dominate the back page. The quote from uh, Jordan Henderson will hurt them in Munich. Mm. It's good to hear, I think, from your captain after the game, nice and positive. And I think there's merit to what he's saying in terms of how good Liverpool are as a counter attacking team. I'm sure they fancy their chances if scoring over there. Just a reference to Mo Salah here, uh, Mo way through. A little bit disappointed maybe in terms of Salah's performance. Such high standards he set on a week to week basis uh, for Liverpool. Wasn't quite at it. Uh, last night when you know a home goal would have been absolutely key I like this picture it for, um, of Robertson and Kate it's in a couple of the, the papers having a bit of a <laughs> Robertson having a bit of a <laughs> scream up. and Kate we're talking about how you treat your players you yeah, can't yeah. scream at players too much Kate is obviously thinking well, why, why are you raising your voice what, what, you don't need to shout that's a, but that, an indication of the frustration there on Robertson's uh, face as that game uh, went on last night uh, Sal again this particular one this chance he had Mm. Uh, on first half ball to the back, uh, back post uh, that header usually very good clinical arriving at the back post probably uh, symptomatic of his performance just not uh, not quite at it this is an interesting one on the back of the Dior de Star for me in terms of Reds go for Sancho Manchester United linked with Jaden Sancho yeah. potentially in the summer fee of like 100 million euros reportedly off you're the shaking ba- your head well, no, it's just amazing uh, less than a year in the Bundesliga signed for like less than uh, 10 million and I think it's in- interesting in terms of potentially what it mean for other players at Manchester United in terms of the turnover of personnel don't be surprised Sancho, uh, Sancho and the likes of Sanchez even Lukaku heading out the other way that's a, that's a huge amount of money but in terms of Sancho joining up with the likes of uh, Rashford uh, Lingard and Martial young players developing and proving that must that be that's a great headline for Manchester United supporters mm. to read. I, I would imagine. There's the photo. That's an even <laughs> that's an even better one of Robertson. <laughs> okay, uh, I can't let it go. He's even putting his hands on him. He just, just needs him to really get a get a grip of uh, Kate there. I don't know who you'd fancy really like in terms of oh, Andy, Robertson. Robertson? Andy Robertson. Andy oh, Robertson. Street fighter. Street fighter. Like he's he's a Scot. Like, oh, they're, without a doubt. Like you roof, reckon he's what, what are you trying to say? You pull a bottle out of his, out of his back pocket, like <laughs> typical kind of Glaswegian style. Yeah, uh, I can't believe you said that. Um, but anyway, yeah, and again, obviously, just repeating the 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 picture, just repeating the the Salah miss there, and yeah, all the headlines indicating a bit of frustration from Liverpool's point of uh, view. They didn't get that. Uh, lead last night against Bayern but also you sense a little bit of optimism there that Bayern Munich as well didn't get the uh, uh, the away goal at Anfield as well very evenly poised I still feel slight advantage uh, to Liverpool off the back of the results last night in, in some respects I think maybe small opportunity missed for Bayern seeing as though Liverpool had that little bit of a soft centre in the in the heart of the defence Matip made a very nervous first 45 minutes a lot of talk about Fabinho last night mm. and a half Matip very nervous uh, in the first 45 minutes and for me a little bit of frustration from Bayern Munich they couldn't take advantage of that and, and wrestle that away goal Yeah and the game was live of course on Virgin Media Sport last night Graeme Souness was in studio on analysis and here he is speaking about Liverpool's midfield and that scoreless draw Liverpool tried to put them under pressure and what, what Bayern were doing were just turning out and going back to the goalkeeper Neuer's good with his feet and he was picking passes we were like our hands are in, our heads on our hands at times wow why are you doing that but apart from early on when Manny nearly got a, a head on a Square pass from Neuer, he didn't give it away. He was very, very good, and that's a you know that's a that's a great sort of get out ball if you're under pressure. If your goalkeeper's that get out of jail ball, if your if your goalkeeper's that good on the ball. But I, I'd come back to Liverpool. I'm disappointed in Liverpool's midfield. You get, don't take my word for it. When you think at the start of the season, he's got Keita coming in, he's tried to get Fakir and he signed Fabinho. That tells him he's not entirely happy. He saw that as a priority, and I think you saw that at the highest level. In the Premier League, they get away with steamrolling teams, mm. the midfield. But when a little bit of class, a little bit of cuteness is necessary, I don't, Liverpool don't have that in midfield. And did you see signs of frustration from him? As you say, we don't know what the little exchange at the end was Which there. But, will, but no, will, will Klopp be frust- yeah. frustrated after the way that game panned out in general? Yeah, I think. I think like all, like every Liverpool supporter, you're hoping they're going to go to Munich with some sort of advantage. It's not the end of the world because Van Dijk will be back. They could go there and nick it. But he knows that in Munich, you're going to go there, not have a lot of the ball, be on the back foot, and, and you have to hope you're going to be lucky and you're going to defend well and nick something. Liverpool are not going to go there and, and boss the game. You know, Munich is a hard place to go and get a result. Graham Souness there speaking on Virgin Media Sport last night. Kenny, do you agree with that? That he was a little bit disappointed with Liverpool's midfield? Since, like, were you disappointed with Liverpool's midfield last night? 
Yeah, I, I take his point in terms of you could tell but how he looked to invest in the summer club, the players he uh, looked to bring in. Kate obviously was signed priest, but he came in the summer. Uh, Fabinho obviously couldn't play Fabinho on that uh, central m- uh, midfield position. I think uh, Fabinho's introduction this summer for me get, gave Liverpool another a tactical option in midfield. Predominantly up until the summer, they've played with a holding midfielder, Henderson, and, and, and two in front. Uh, Wijnaldum, Milner, Oxide chamber when he came to the club. So you play with three orthodox uh, central midfielders. Fabinho coming uh, to the club, and even catered to a point, but more so Fabinho, gave Klopp the option of when the bigger games for me came round the season, and, and no bigger than Bayern Munich away coming up in a, in a couple of weeks, it gave him the option to go to an orthodox two in midfield like Henderson and Fabinho, a real defensive shield as a pair in midfield to give real screen and protection to the back four. So you got your defensive four and a, and a really solid defensively minded midfield two. So when you do that, you play with a number 10. Rather than playing with three orthodox midfielders, you play with a midfield two and you actually then play with a 10. A bit like Bourne did last mm-hmm. night. Thiago and Martinez really played as a two, uh, two in there and uh, James played as the number 10. So when Souness talks about a lack of a creative edge, for me, that's, that, that's the flip which Liverpool need at times to go with it in midfield two and really lock down that central uh, area of the pitch. But what, what, does, what that does, it gives you the opportunity to introduce a, a 10. Now, you've got to make a decision that's then. That's Shaqiri then. Exactly. So he's talking about uh, Fek didn't get Fekir. Then. But for me, they have that player there already in terms of Fekir. You could argue maybe Firmino dropping into that number 10 and Origi maybe up front. They, or they Salah. put Salah in there earlier in the yeah, season. Exactly. And, Sh- and Shaqiri coming on, on, on onto the flanks. So that's the, kind of, that's the kind of flip which maybe Klopp may be looking at. I don't think he'll go there. Uh, potential for the second leg, particularly Van Dijk comes in. I think uh, uh, Fabinho going to the centre of the pitch, but I don't. I don't think he plays it too necessarily with Henderson. But I'd, I'd like to see that a little bit more because that for me, you're always a little bit more, bit more secure defensively with that orthodox midfield too playing 10, 15 yards apart, squared of each other in centre midfield, and just really sitting behind the ball with your defenders and allowing that front three and that little number ten, that little bit more of a creative spark in that area of the pitch who you can get the ball to and get himself in the half turn and give him that little bit of magic which you don't get from that orthodox midfield three. You don't necessarily get from Wijnaldum, Keita, a little bit more clunky, very good players, mm. but orthodox central midfield players as opposed to that kind of specialised uh, no, uh, number 10, which I think uh, Graham Stilness is alluding to there. So it'll be interesting to see if he does look at that kind of flip, Klopp, but I have my good feeling tells me he, he won't. He kind of trusts that orthodox kind of 4-3-3 three, three in there and just that front three, which has served him so well. Yeah, and just a reminder as well that uh, Graham Souness' clip came from Virgin Media Sport last night, which is the home of European football in Ireland with more than 400 UEFA Champions League, Europa League and the Nations League games live this season. Virgin Media Sport is exclusive to all Virgin Media TV customers. You can also download the TV Anywhere app and stream all the action whenever and wherever they like. It's interesting we speak about this because like, just looking at some of the play ratings this morning at the Times, for example, they gave Jordan Henderson a 9 and Naby Keita... I thought actually wasn't that bad last night. I see, I see, like whenever you go on Twitter, you can see players like that getting criticised left, right, and centre. I, I'm just when when Sunes was talking about midfield failings or disappointment in the midfield last night, I was a bit surprised. But from what you're saying, it's more, it's not really a kind of a systems failure in terms of their individual performances. Yeah. It's more what they actually carry out and the role of those particular midfielders in a game like last yeah, night. Yeah, but I think it's their individual uh, qualities as well. I don't think you can expect you can say uh, to Keita, be criticised Keita and Ronaldo. For maybe not getting on the the ball in advanced central areas in in tight areas of the pitch under pressure from players, and not getting on the half turn, manipulating the ball in tight situations, dropping their shoulder and going past one or two players. They're not that type of players. Kate is more of a box to box, high energy, good mm-hmm. technical ability. Don't get me wrong. When Alden for me is a player who's at his best, actually arriving late into the box as that those kind of third man runs, arriving he's a good header of the ball, so actually coming onto the ball as receiving the ball on the half turn with players around them. That's a, that's a kind of very specialised position, that kind of number 10 position uh, which we talk about. So I think they had reasonably decent games last night. The work rate was good. I think they, they kept a reasonable defensive shape. I thought Bayern Munich played a better football in that central area of the pitch. Uh, Thiago, James to a point. I thought they, uh, they worked the ball, kept control of the ball a lot better. But that wouldn't be unusual for Liverpool in terms of necessarily getting, not dominating the ball and dominating possession on that central area. It's not really Liverpool's DNA. Liverpool, by and large, a little bit more direct in terms of getting the ball back to front. If they, go, if they can go long early, they will, particularly into the space in behind defenders. If you remember, Henderson played a brilliant ball uh, first half 
but they're struggling to get on the ball and make a few passes in his own half hit a diagonal mm. over the head of Sula that diagonal run from Salah off the right wing in between full back and centre half almost got in he got a shot on target off the outside of his, of his left foot so Liverpool aren't overly obsessed in terms of dominating possession possession stats you know, passes completed they, if they can get the ball back to front early they'll do that and they've had a lot of uh, uh, success doing that so you're right wouldn't be overly critical of Keita I didn't think Keita when Alderman necessarily uh, below par but there is kind of limits when you put those type of players on the pitch there is certain uh, limits in terms of what they can do I don't think you're overly critical in terms of well they didn't thread the ball through the eye of a needle they should have beaten those two players on the edge of the box you know Shaqiri's that type of player can drive you mad a little bit but occasionally get on the ball he'll give some of the eyes a little reverse pass in behind and open up up a defence he's that, that that type of player and that's the decision which Klopp will have going into the second leg whether he trusts uh, Shaqiri in that area of the pitch now you might say well that's an obvious he's got to play him why wouldn't he play him but our possession of football, would you trust uh, Shaqiri? Would he show that same amount of defensive discipline and noose uh, in a defensive area of the pitch as those other three players? No. So that's the kind of uh, the trade-off and those are the decisions which Klopp will have to make, particularly in the key area of the pitch in central midfield. And likewise, Bourne, for fear of talking it to death, Martinez came in last night at the expense of Gore- uh, Goretzka, probably a better footballer. Now, he'll have a decision to make in terms of does he get more a bit more creative edge into his team, maybe sacrifice Martinez, again, more defensive-minded, mind- and introduce Goretzka into that central midfield alongside Thiago. Gives them more of a creative edge in that central area of the pitch, carries more of a threat for them going forward. But at the same time, that Liverpool front three might be licking their lips a little bit because that defensive shield with Martinez in there won't be there for the second leg. So both managers, for me, have decisions to make in that central area of the pitch in terms of personnel. Yeah, is there a chance that we completely underrated this Bayern Munich team, that some of the talk around it was that they're not as good as they have been? And you, you speak about that midfield trio, yeah. and they sometimes can be a little bit unheralded despite the amount of trophies that they've got uh, across that midfield trio. Uh, but at the same time, like there was no surprise really when you saw them play so well in that area of the yeah. pitch that's like I'm, I'm not sure where, where this Bayern Munich team is at but it's certainly a lot harder than I think some people were saying yeah but I, I would agree in terms of not as good as previous Bayern Munich now when you think it's some of the really top class Bayern Munich teams Ribery and Robin at their at, at their very best Alonso in that centre of the pitch Muller Thomas Muller when he was playing at, at his very best his real drop off in his performances last mm-hmm. kind of uh, 12 months so no they're not at that particular level but they're, they're a decent side I mean it, Coleman and Gnabry for me the two before the game last night I thought it could be a real threat these two Gnabry not surprised me but thought he was the, the better of the two so he was very efficient in, in possession of the ball good decision making sh- uh, played very well in 1v1 situation he left Robinson for dead first half uh, close to the end line and created a chance uh, for Lewandowski so they, uh, Gnabry in particular impressed me Hummels as well at the back ageing as he is not the most mobile a little bit slow on the tumble defended his box superbly well great anticipation sense danger made good decisions nice and calm in his defending uh, when they needed him uh, I like the full backs the full backs are as good as anything really Kimmich and uh, Alaba so yeah, maybe people they were careful talk- not to push forward too much as well, which is kind of yeah, exactly. essential at this point playing Liverpool. Yeah, exactly. And they, I, I like to see that. They, uh, from, that's what for me what Liverpool need to do a little bit. I know um, talk after the game, Robertson and Alexander Armel not as efficient going forward as they as they had been previously. But when you got someone like Gnabry and Coman in particular, absolutely dynamite in terms of speed. You've got to modify your approach a little bit, especially with an untried partnership at centre half. You've got to pull your full backs, one goes, you've got to pull someone a little bit closer to you. You've really got to uh, uh, be mindful of the uh, the counter attack. So I think that's, for me, that's playing smart when you make those small modifications. You don't change your philosophy, but you make those small little tactical adjustments uh, considering what you're, uh, what you're up against. So it was a little bit of a tactical element to the game last night, which I enjoyed. It wasn't the top level. In terms of technical, the football, misplaced pass, a little bit of sloppiness here and there. But I think that was the, ten- the tension of the occasion maybe creeping in into the game. But, but I did enjoy it. And like I said, evenly poised. Say evenly poised, I give Liverpool a slight advantage. But I'm always fascinated. I always reserve judgment in terms of when I see those two team sheets come in an hour before kickoff, And that's always the time you look and you think, you make your decision in terms of, well, yeah, well, that's interesting what he's doing here. Because of that, yeah, I really fancy Liverpool now. Or, oof. Not too sure. Probably I give Bayern Munich the edge, but you're right. I think some people maybe underestimated uh, that uh, Bayern Munich team. Not as good as previous Bayern Munich teams, but still not the type of team to go to even to some a cauldron like Anfield and be overawed by the occasion. I thought they weren't. Thought they started well. The mentality was good. Work great. Good defensive uh, discipline to the <coughs> team, and I, I was reasonably impressed with Bayern. Let's talk about your area of the pitch, Fabinho. Is he showing up centre back to be the easiest place in, in the pitch to play? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, no, I think you're right. Uh, are you taking the Mick there saying it's the easiest place in the... Uh, uh, no, but I, I, I think... I wouldn't dare say it's easy. No, but I think to a certain extent, uh, you're right. Because really, logically, when you think about it, playing the centre-half, which I did for most of my career, you got the whole uh, game taking place ahead. You don't have to worry about, uh, to a large extent, what, what's going on behind you. And generally, when you do, the keeper's coming out to, to bail you out. So the whole uh, pitch is in front of you. That's when I talk about Hummels, when, when Bermuda got pinned to the edge of the box for, for a period uh, last night. He was kind of very, very comfortable with the ball being played in front, stepping out, making uh, interceptions, winning headers, crosses, coming into the box. Different to a certain extent, the higher you get up the pitch to the halfway line, those big distances open up and behind you can be a little bit more exposed. But you're right, centre half a little bit more time on the ball. I played centre midfield a couple of times during my career. Early in my career, I was put in a centre midfield, didn't enjoy it. Really uncomfortable in there, wasn't at ease at all totally different position having to play a little bit on the uh, the kind of half turn it was okay in defensive situations because your natural instincts kick in but in terms of getting on the ball and having to receive the ball and players there there behind you constantly having to have your head in the swivel I couldn't do it I really couldn't uh, do it so to, to play as a central midfielder at centre half and have the whole play in front of you and have that little bit more time in possession I think it is. In possession, it, it is a lot easier. Now, you're tested it maybe a little bit more defensively mm. because you haven't got, as a centre midfielder, you have the luxury maybe centre half behind you who can bail you out. You're the last line defence there. Got to be very careful you don't make too many mistakes. I thought he did okay, uh, Fabinho. The, the statistics are actually, like he had a 100... That was that, that was that, What's well, that you're going to start throwing at me now? No, just the start, Fabinho's performance last night. Yeah. Uh, like I, I think it was pretty clear from anybody watching on TV that he was outstanding, but like a 100% success rate with his tackles and clearances, one interception, five ball recoveries, and committed just one foul. Like it, I was obviously taking a look and I said this is the easy, easiest position in the park to play because this was an individually excellent performance. Yeah, yeah, I, take, I don't take, absorb too much that was stats that you throw at me, but yeah, I, I t- in terms of performance, I thought he, play, I thought he was solid. I thought the problem was Matip in the first half, like really nervous uh, start to the game. Even that Gnabry cross I spoke, but he couldn't sort his feet and nearly put it into his own goal. And then quickly after that, there was the Allison mistake. He made a bit of a mistake, but even still he knocked it, it arrived at the feet of Matip on the edge of the box. And in, instead of thinking, right, keeper's made a mistake, just put my foot through the ball here. He tried to flick with the outside of his foot on the edge of his box. With, with Bourne putting a squeeze on, gave away possession almost... So when those type of things happen, that really spreads uh, nervousness uh, around the team. And he was really struggling that first half. It kind of composed himself a little bit, uh, second half. But it, it just underlined what we already knew, that little bit of a soft centre. But everybody, the talk was about Fabinho leading into the game. And on the night, really, Matip, for me, looked a little, very much ill at ease, particularly in that first half. Is there just a case here that perhaps when Virgil van Dijk is on the pitch he just spreads a calmness? It's not just what he does on the ball and how yeah. good he is as a player. Like Matip playing beside him is a big camera. He's not going to be as erratic as he was last yeah. night. No, I think you're right. And I think when van Dijk is on the pitch, it's no surprise Lovren when he had a run of games against uh, alongside van Dijk last year looked a better player. And likewise Matip, I, I, I think you're right. He makes. I think there is a psychological aspect talking about that area as well in terms of just seeing Van Dijk as presence, knowing how good he is. But just his individual attributes, I think he makes it easier uh, for players as well because he's a good defender. He gets around, uh, gives uh, good cover to people, bails them out. Passing generally is uh, is very accurate. Accurate, good communication gives good information to people to his uh, central defensive partner. That helps them out as well in terms of giving them good positional sense, good information. So all of those things, you're absolutely right. His presence on the pitch and his individual attributes certainly helps his partner alongside him and indirectly fullbacks and central midfielders directly in front of him. So yeah, without a doubt, just saying really what we already know, his presence, his qualities were missed last night and be a big advantage if, as we expect, he comes back into the team uh, for the second leg. Yeah, talking about that second leg, are Liverpool going to progress? Ah, uh, well, you're going to make me repent yourself now. Well, like, it, all the, it all depends on the team sheet. Yeah, it, I give them a slight, I give them a slight advantage. Uh, mm. Liverpool, by virtue of the fact that I, I, I think they can, they, they can play better, and a big factor that Van Dijk's going to come into the team, and that's really going to improve the team. I looked at Bayern Munich team, and I don't think there's too many adjustments uh, you can make. I talk about maybe Goretzka coming in centre midfield a little bit more of a, a creative element to the team, but I don't think you can change team. When you talk about Ribery coming in, the expense of maybe Coleman or, or Gnabry, but for me that really does and elevate them onto a, into a different level. That, for me, that was potentially the strongest team they could have put out last night. I like the back four. I think the, they've been seeing a lot of goals this season, but I think the partnership with Sula uh, at centre-half alongside Hummels uh, is the best one. 
So I, 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 I thought they played very well last night, Bayern Munich, but I think Liverpool have got a lot more to come and Van Dijk is going to be a big part of that. So for me, it's slight advantage uh, for Liverpool uh, go, going into the game in two weeks. But even that intervene, intervening period on, the game Sunday, in, another uh, injury to another key person, El Salah, limping out of the game at the weekend. Again, fine margins before the game. You lose one or two of those key players. The scales tipping uh, Bayern's favour. So not much in it. But for me, again, like I say, but Liverpool played to their best. Bayern played to their best. Liverpool go through. But the fact is, Liverpool didn't find their best uh, performance uh, last night. It repeated that performance again over in Bayern, even with the likes of Van Dijk in the, in the team. Not quite at it, just a little bit off in certain areas. Individuals not quite at it. Again, but this Bayern Munich team is good enough to take advantage. Yeah, we can see there as well. It was uh, nil all in Lyon against Barcelona in their first leg as well last night. And then tonight it's Atletico Madrid against Juventus. And we've got Schalke uh, against Manchester City. The other big football story from last night, though, is the news that Mauricio Sarri has survived. It was looking like a period earlier in the evening that he could be gone by the time they got around to this morning. But he's hung on by his fingertips. It's been a, a, a tough, another tough week for him, obviously. Monday night, the Chelsea fans joining in with the Manchester United fans saying you're going to get sacked in the morning. Uh, like the... The idea now that Maurizio Sarri could come in and stamp his own philosophy on a Chelsea team and have time to do that is obviously ridiculous at this point. So I have a bit of sympathy for Maurizio Sarri on that end because Chelsea knew what they were getting and clearly the philosophy just has he just hasn't had time to, to stamp it down on a group of players and that's why he only used 14 yeah. players, he said, 15 players. Because yeah. No, I disagree with you, to be honest, because yeah. I think the philosophy is pretty obvious and I think he, he managed to... Um, get those messages across very quickly in terms of how he wanted his team to play in and out possession because you say that he hasn't had time you look at their first 10, 50 games of the season they were unbeaten for the first uh, 10, 11 games playing some uh, wonderful football really playing as a real cohesive unit so it's not as if he's been struggling all season so for me the argument he's struggling to implement is flat no it was there early in the season but the inherent flaws not in the system but in terms of the individual players uh, within that system was pretty evident. Even when they were winning now, and I've probably been on record saying this before, I started the season, I was, I'm playing well and, and, and on that good run. I was looking at the team thinking, bloody hell, George, he, he really can't run. He can't, he can't tackle. And I, I'd look at Louise, and they've been a huge fan of David Louise's defending. Alonso the more I looked at him, I thought he's making too many mistakes. And I thought, you know what? If there's a bit of a drop off with this team, or they come up against the team, it was a little bit more possession and pens them in and really asks us questions of them defensively. I'm not convinced of this team. That axis of Jorginho, David Louise, and Alonso, I was looking at thinking that's porous. That's 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 not strong enough. So obviously it's come to fruition. Uh, there's been a drop off in terms of performance, but the drop off has come up because of the deficiencies. It owes three players in particular from a defensive point of view. So you're talking now about philosophy. A lot of the talk is screaming, can't say into that uh, hold a mid, uh, midfield position. So for me, something's got to change because performances aren't good enough. They're getting exposed time and time again, those players in, uh, in particular. So you've got to change something. David Luiz is suddenly going to become the best defender in the world in the next fortnight. Alonso isn't going to st uh, stop making those mistakes. Jorginho isn't going to discover another five yards of pace in the, in the, in the next uh, couple of uh, months of the season. He's not going to develop that kind of defensive, Kante defensive mindset either. It's not going to happen. So, so what are he going to change it? So for me, I know people have been screaming for it, but can't they, can't they go back into the hold of midfield position? Uh, Christensen, say, for example, coming in at centre-half, for me, he's a better defender than David Luiz. You don't change your philosophy just by making two adjustments in terms of personnel. The defensive, the shape stays the same, 4-3 with the holding midfield player. You could argue is Kante is technically efficient as Jorginho. Maybe not. But for me, he's still comfortable receiving the ball and, and playing 10, 15 uh, uh, yard passes. I don't think necessarily your philosophy has to change just by making those couple of individual changes uh, within the team. And that's where I look at Sadi and think y you need to be a little bit more flexible here because this is only going one way. And it's all well and good. Um, no, if I go down, I'm going to go down and do it my way. But I'll, I don't think he has to necessarily change his philosophy mm. to, to get a reaction and, and maybe to get a bit of a, a spike in terms of performance. He's got to recognise those key areas where he's deficient at the moment and make some, and make some changes. Jorginho has to come out of that team. He's got to get Kante uh, back in there and he's got to make an adjustment in the defence. That uh, combination of David Luiz and Alonso, it's weak. It's as simple as that. Defensively, not good enough. So if he doesn't make those adjustments, I I, it's only going to go one way. It's literally uh, only a matter of time. And I'm surprised. I'm surprised he hasn't uh, made those adjustments. For me, we're talking about earlier being smart. Like Solskjaer, I see a little bit in terms of tactically how he changes teams in Manchester United team, which I really liked. He did it again against uh, Chelsea. He was speaking about uh, Kovac not sending his fullbacks so uh, high up the pitch. 
those little small modifications, small little adjustments that you need to make without sacrificing a total change of philosophy where the players think, oh, he, he, do, he, he doesn't believe in this at all, we're flip-flopping here between systems. But those small little adjustments players look at and think, yeah, that's smart. That is really smart. That's what we needed. That made a, a difference. And that's what uh, Sarri needs to do because I think at the moment the players are losing confidence in him and the system a little bit because of that, because he's just repeating the same things week in, week out, same results. Uh, uh, below power performance, below power performance, defeat, defeat, defeat. And I think the players look as if they're losing a bit of confidence as well. Yeah, and there's every chance, I think. It's easy to say that Manchester City could do another number on them in the Carabao Cup final this Sunday. City, of course, in action tonight. Do, do they have, to a certain extent, some of the same problems that Liverpool have in terms of squad depth? That, like, while their bench is excellent, beyond that, if they get injuries, suddenly the players coming off the bench are, aren't great. He, he does like to operate with a small-ish squad, Guardiola. It doesn't mean that they don't have depth. That's a stretch. <laughs> I, 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 know, a stretch I know it's a stretch, but in terms of it, I don't know what you're saying. I actually agree with it, to be honest with you. In terms of uh, Marino, you spoke about this before as well. In terms of having, he'd rather have it a l little bit smaller. But Pep is always complaining about the calendar, and he's like, he, he made some sarcastic comments in in the build-up to the to the game tonight, saying that, oh, I wonder will FIFA or UEFA, whoever, come up with another competition to sort of ruin our preseason because he's talking about only three weeks off for his players. Like he, he cares a lot about a, a, a thin enough group of players, and I'm not saying for one second that Manchester City if they get one or two injuries they're screwed but then again you look at the, the Fernandinho issue around Christmas as well when he was missing performances and the nosedive like I, I do wonder if there is more similarities between the, the, the depth of Manchester City squad and Liverpool squad than we realise yeah you know I understand what you're saying I, I don't think so I, I still think it's a strong uh, Manchester City squad I pinch of salt what uh, Guardiola's talk and he mm. kind of tried to incorporate pre-season tournaments uh, and all that type of thing. Uh, I think it's fair argument in terms of what he's saying, but I don't like to hear it from a manager. Don't like to hear it from me. It's kind of too negative. It's planted little seeds in your players' minds in terms of a little drop-off performance. It's almost acceptable because, as we all know, there's too many games. I think there's too many games. I never like to hear that from a manager. I think generally he's handled it quite well in terms of squad rotation. Uh, Guardiola from week to week, you never quite be too sure in terms of uh, no, Aguero, Jesus, the wide man, Mares coming in, Sane, he kind of flips there a little bit, kind of the rotation, centre midfield, and even at the back in terms of Stone in and out Laporte on a many the fullbacks and always had injuries and I think it's a good thing to be fair I think what that small squad what it ensures if everybody's getting game time you are going to accumulate a couple of injuries here and there but generally speaking that kind of squad which you, which, which you keep together that kind of 18 20 whatever the 21 man squad everybody's getting game time there isn't two or three players who are always on the outside looking in not getting the amount of game time that they need a little bit of discontent can kind of creep into the squad a couple of big personalities not happy making known their feelings a little bit of whispering going on in, in the dress and all that type of thing can happen with kind of a too, uh, too big a squad the smaller squad a little bit more tight everybody getting enough game time feeling part of it which they will do at Manchester City being in all the cup competitions helps as well a lot of big games coming up at this stage of the season everybody getting a piece of it minutes on the pitch I think that's all good I think there's there's a flip argument in terms of you're making two games fatigue all that type of thing but also in terms of everybody getting a piece of it big games coming in that big general rush moment the big games coming that's exactly what players want to be a, a part of I think generally Guardiola's handled it quite well in terms of uh, uh, rotating his players but I, uh, but I don't like to hear that I must admit I heard that interview I was cringing a little bit really I'd, yeah I'd love to hear him stay stay away from it just say look he says that sort of stuff quite a lot doesn't he yeah he does yeah I just don't like to hear it just I'd rather he stay as a player I'm just thinking myself as a player in the not in the dressing room but listening to that as players always do managers being interviewed I'd much rather hear yeah well it is what it is a lot of games coming but bring him on mm. I trust me players I have confidence in me players they're enjoying it I'm enjoying it this is where we want to be business end of the season all the cup competitions yeah can't get enough of it yeah. That type of thing for me would kind of invigorate me a little bit more as a player rather than the kind of, well, a lot of games, can't ask for more from me players. Don't be surprised if there is a physical drop off, what's being demanded of more players. Don't, don't like to hear that. No, for sure. And there is kind of the element as well when something goes wrong, the first thing you want is another game to sort of rectify it, as we saw with yeah. Manchester United on Monday night. I guess last week there was a lot of people who were kind of rushing to say that Solskjaer has been found yeah. out and uh, maybe he's still been found out and Chelsea were just a, a bit of a walkover given everything we've seen from them recently. But ultimately, you're still looking at this game on Sunday and I know this is going to be the last time we'll be speaking to you before Sunday uh, as an absolute potential cracker and like really anybody who's riding off Manchester United for this one hasn't really watched too much of them Yeah, recently. did you watch the game? Yeah. Uh, the Chelsea, did you watch the Chelsea yeah. game? Monday, I was so impressed with Manchester United. I was interested because of the reasons that you said off the back of it. Not getting beat to PSG 
appreciate, but the manner of it, mm. second half in particular, it kind of fell apart. They became very uh, disjointed, almost like lost a lot of that confidence, that bit of a stroke which they'd had previously. Uh, previous games it wasn't there kind of evaporated very quickly in that second half against PSG so again look at the Chelsea game I thought this is very interesting the manager in terms of the tactical setup again that little small adjustments which we spoke about we kind of dime in the midfield Mata at the very top in orthodox uh, front two Mata getting around the feet of Jorginho as we've seen a couple of teams do pr- previously nullify his threat not only that get on the ball and actually influence the game from that position because Jorginho just can't get around the pitch and may, may tack on the first goal Mata pretty much set up uh, the move Jorginho is not able to get round his feet and influence absolutely anything but United good uh, good, good shape good defensive shape back four looks solid oh, and I haven't said that too many times over the past couple of years I like the partnership of uh, Small and Lindelof for me it's my preferred choice has been for some time I thought if to get them two on the pitch that looks like a partnership to me solid in the full back positions the spine of the team attitude the intensity was a good started well physically got round the pitch oh, and made contact with Chelsea made tackles and carried a real threat uh, not just a counter attack but in possession as well so the attitude the reaction to that PSG for me was absolutely spot on what I would have hoped for and you can see the reaction to the United supporters huge M- Manchester United support there but even still it was obvious watching the game the noise they were generating I know they were winning the game but the noise for the majority of that game that they created you can sense even amongst the supporters yeah we're, we enjoy what we're seeing here not now, don't buy into this Man- uh, Manchester United way because, like I said, at times it's almost a little bit of a counter-attacking style under Solskjaer. But you need to make any apologies for that. You play to the, to the strengths of your players, and I like what I'm saying. And that was a, for me, that was a really not not more of a solid performance, real kind of top quality performance in some respects. Really uh, disciplined, kind of battle hard, and just mentally, physically, almost overpowered. Chelsea were kind of after a decent start to the game. That kind of lack of confidence, that bit of brittleness crept into the game second half and United really uh, breezed through in the second half so yeah uh, uh, with the weekend game coming up against Liverpool can't wait yeah and it's going to be live and off the ball and news talk as well uh, if you're out and about uh, we're going to get Darren Cleary in for this morning's sports news in just a moment but before that uh, we've got another teaser for another interview it's coming your way tomorrow uh, it's with motorsports uh, phenom Craig Breen uh, I'm not sure how much of a petrol head you are Kenny yeah, I know, I've heard him being interviewed before, but it's interesting you were talking about the mindset, uh, mixed martial arts in terms of that kind of very total confidence. I mean, I would have thought that particular sport, mm. motorcycling, very very similar. Yeah, like a rally driver. In nature, a rally driver, excuse me, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah, motorcycle, it's the same type of thing. Mm. You need that absolute, total, confidence, almost like arrogance in terms of n- no bad thing. Definitely, especially given the, the natural peril of it. Are you a speed freak? Like, what's the fastest you've ever gone in a car? Did you see me run on a football pitch? You know, I said I was certainly no speed freak. <laughs> <laughs> what was the top speed on your Mondeo? Um, <laughs> I don't like driving too fast. That, that's a bit driving Miss Daisy, like show me age type thing. But even when I was a bit younger, never, never, never drove too fast on the. You were the designated driver. I've been driver done a few for... times. Don't get me wrong. I've been, I've been, in, I've been in the old. Uh, you know, you got to take the points. So you got to go to one of these places for the day and go through the motions and all they show all the video clips and say be careful this your high cross <laughs> you know now that when you're growing up walking across the street what was that called the high cross code was it the the it? Oh, uh, somebody didn't know it remember it safe cross code safe cross code yeah it was a similar thing for drivers now rather than take the points in your life they, well i've been to a few of them but that's literally 33 mile an hour and a 30 mile an hour zone is this that what you of, did yeah well occasionally yeah on a few occasions but in terms of actually speed I got into a car once at Millwall, right, um, uh, with a player, a senior player. So, do you want to lift? We're going down to the, the ground from the training ground down to the Millwall ground. Uh, he was a Welsh international uh, player, Gavin. Gee, I can't remember his name. Uh, he got into his car. Oh, my God. Uh, honest to God. I've never experienced that. Night. <laughs> Absolutely t- terrified. Oh, terrified. Sweating when I get out of the car. Why was he going 35 Speed. miles per hour? <laughs> Speed. And, and, now, and maybe that stuck in my head, but I've never been a... Uh, never been a fast driver. So that, um, how long does it take you to get back down to Kerry, Catterside Vane or whatever? Where are you, Trillay? Where about you, Dingo? Just outside okay. Killarney. Just outside oh, Killarney. Really how long would it take you to generally? You could do it in three and a half at no traffic. Three and a half. So that base, you're prob- probably five. I'm, I'm probably closer to five. I was, I was heading down there. <laughs> very um, much, very much, yeah, my own speed. Well, you talk about that uh, feeling of like being in a roller coaster, like you're in a car like that. Well, this is what happened. Gavin McGuire. Gavin McGuire. Ex Welsh international, yeah. He was a speed freak in the world. He played. If you ever saw Gavin Maguire play, you were, before your time on, he he drove the same way as he played. What does that mean? Oh, head case. Head case. Yeah. <laughs> 
so basically, Craig Breen uh, got behind the uh, behind the wheel of a rally cross car last week, which uh, to anybody to the untrained eye, uh, it's kind of like a rally car, except it's on a track. I went out to Mondello Park, and as I say, we'll play the full interview uh, with Craig tomorrow. But I did get into the car beside Craig uh, for a bit of a spin, and uh, here's how it went. We're here in Mondello Park for the launch of the Irish Rallycross Championship. You can probably hear the cars going around the track at the moment. I'm going to get in this one. Uh, it is a Fiesta. Not much of the original Fiesta is left, but thankfully, Craig Green is going to be driving me around this afternoon. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so I'm in fairly, I'd say I'm in fairly safe hands here anyway. <laughs> I would hope so. How did you find the first drive? Yeah, it was nice. I, I've never... Uh I've never driven anything so powerful before, to be honest with you, so it's all very, very new to me, but it's nice. It's a nice, a nice place to enjoy yourself, so we'll have a bit of fun. <laughs> Looked like you were having a fit in the passenger seat there. You weren't in control of your upper body movement there at all. The colour coordination was desperate. Like, yeah. a luminous green helmet and a, a bright orange. What the oh. hell was that on you? Like, oh. when you put the plane, isn't that when you get on the plane? And... More like a rocket. Oh my God. Uh, a lot of fun. A lot. Do you like roller coasters? If you like it, Darren, by the way, you're very welcome. Hello. Um, How do I follow that? Uh, now we're playing, uh, playing it again. Just to get is that you now? Is that you behind the wheel? Well, Absolutely that's me, yeah. Not, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's not, there's not a lot protecting the kind of skeleton of a Fiesta there. It's only carbon fibre, so uh, it leaves you a, a tad nervous, I'm not going to lie. Your life is in the hands of uh, Craig Breen there, and uh, he's a fantastic driver. There was other cars on the track as well. You managed to swerve around them a couple of times. He drifted around the corners, I want to use that phrase. Oh, and you can see your hands shaking. You have no idea oh, what to terrifying. do with them, and they're just shaking. I was terrified beforehand, but as soon as we started, I absolutely <laughs> loved it. <laughs> well, like, <that's laughs> to be fair, if you got in the car as well, it would be the exact same. I mean, you are, getting, you are traveling at an unbelievable speed. There is incredible acceleration off it. It reminds me of those videos, you know, when you see an old lady pass out on a roller coaster. Oh, and you're the old lady passing out the road. Yeah, but like, I absolutely Whoa. love roller coasters. Is the thing I, ab I absolutely loved being in that car. It was I was I don't know why I was nervous before because as soon as I got in, I was like, this is amazing. I love this. Uh, so it was Have great. Have you been on the Coo Cullen title park? Uh, how, I, I'm not that much of an expert uh, now. One day, if I get the bravery, Kenny, what's it like? Only a couple of miles up there. I haven't been up there. I promised the unfly taken, but it's the biggest one of the biggest wooden roller coasters. Yeah. Around likes had a huge reputation. Huge reputation is right. Well, you've talked yourself up as a big roller coaster. Big, you've um, got one of the biggest in the world. Which roller coasters Two, have you gone on then? Five mile up the road. Big fan. Well, like all the ones in Orlando, like from ah. the Incredible Hulk to whatever Alton it is. How have you been? Uh, uh, few I, haven't been, been I, been, I was in Alton Towers when I was very young. A few, so. few, good, few good rides over there to test you. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to get over and, and try them bring out. That, don't bring the green hel helmet with you, though. <laughs> you might struggle to get on the, on the ride. <laughs> the height requirement that would do them in. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite needed to make the height requirement. Is that what you're saying? That's, oh, that's exactly oh, it. I, I was, was, was going to say that I didn't get on any of the Alton Tower rides because I was too young. It was actually last weekend. I was just too small to get on any Darren, what is going on? We start with Liverpool Owen and Jurgen Klopp provided the best summation of their Champions League stalemate with Bayern Munich. He said, a big ballyhoo before the game and then nothing really happens. The match promised so much, but the first leg of the last 16 tie finished nil-nil in the end. On a nervy night in Anfield, Klopp though, trying to look on the bright side. And not a lot of things happen. We had our moments. We had our moments, but in these moments you have to score. That's how it is. And then the game changed completely. But because nobody scored, and you saw that in the last couple of minutes, Bayern was like shooting the ball away, he cramps here and there. So it was an intense game for both sides. Um, but yeah, it was not now not a game you will remember in 20 years. Let me say it like this. But um, it's the game we had, and it's the result we have. And now we work with that. Clean sheet without a big man, and probably not a lot of people would have expected that. So that was very good. Um, defending in general was was good. So um, and of course Hendo did a brilliant job there. Huh? So it's unbelievable how many balls he won back and stuff like that. That was a fantastic game from him. And, but um, that's actually what we expect as well. Um, so that. How I said, a lot of things were really good. We played against an outstandingly good side, and each mistake you make, and then you, you it gives you a, a big, cause you a big problem. And so, uh, I'm not over the moon, but I'm completely okay.
Now, Manchester City hope to take a step towards the Champions League quarterfinals later. Pep Guardiola's charges have won four of their last five games. The slip at Newcastle aside, they have been in good form. They only lost one game in the Champions League group stages as they topped Group F to qualify for the knockout rounds. They've played 12 fixtures in all competitions since the new year. They've won 11 times and scored 46 goals along the way. Schalke have struggled in the Bundesliga. They've just six wins in 22 games this season. They're without a win in their last four, two draws, two losses, and they're currently 14th place in the table. Now, Guardiola befuddled his critics before the game by completely agreeing with them. Fans are unsure if he was sarcastic or sincere. Ahead of tonight's game, the City boss addressed the massive argument he's caused on Nigerian Twitter space this week. He was asked whether he's the greatest coach of all time or just lucky. Hello, Pep. Uh, my name is Omar Katsuba. I'm from Nigeria for omarsports.com. You are extremely popular in Nigeria. Yeah. After your achievement yeah. at Barcelona. Oh, and, 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 I was young. Yeah, and you, and you cause massive argument on Nigerian Twitter space. Those who are for Pep believe that Pep is the greatest coach in the world. Those who are against Pep argue that Pep has not been able to win the Champions League since leaving Barcelona. And their argument is because you don't have players like Messi, Javi, Iniesta. I'm that is why <laughs> you've not been able to win the Champions League. What, what do you say to this this school of thought. What's your reaction? I completely agree with them. <laughs> I completely agree with them. I'm not going to argue one second. Because when I was there, I said many times, I win because these guys are incredible players. But I had in Munich as well, in Manchester as well. But in Barcelona, I was a lucky guy. I'm sorry. I was lucky. I agree with them. But you think he's uh, not being sincere? I don't know, it's hard to tell, isn't it? I think he is being sincere. I think he'd be a little bit irked but by, the que by the question, but no, I think there is a little bit of honesty yeah. there. It'd be foolish not to, because it, you can't get away from it. I mean, you can talk about how good a coach that he is, his management techniques, uh, say, tactically how he sets the, the team up, his vision, but when you talk about those individual uh, players there, Iniesta, uh, Xavi in particular playing at their, the peak of their powers I mean you can't get away from that in terms of individual uh, quality that he had at his disposal Yeah for sure uh, it's, a, it's a great question it's one that you, you wonder it, can you get away with asking any tough question if you just kind of say before that the Twitter sphere is going mad and is asking this question it's not me who's saying that you're a fraud it's other people Nigeria thinks you're a fraud I mean I remember when Martin <laughs> O'Neill was asked um, has your luck run out and how angrily he responded to that. Mm. he just stared wait a moment and said you don't win what I've won in football with just luck. And I think there's a little bit about that. I think it's hard to believe that he would ask that in a way where he just framed it so naturally as, as if this is a conversation we have daily. Is Pep Guardiola a fraud? Yeah, yes, that, that is it's remarkable. Yeah, I think you're right in terms of, I, I don't think you can say you're, you're a great manager or a lucky manager. I think the question was, is the individual uh, qualities of players available to you, is that a significant factor mm. in terms of what you can achieve uh, as a coach, I think that would be fair. I think that'd be an obvious one to answer. Well, yeah, of course it is. Now he could argue he's responsible for the development of those players in terms of how good they became, the knowledge he gave them, the information he gave them from a tactical point of view. This is how we're going to play. This is what I expect you to do. These are the areas I need you uh, to be in. And they they use their individual abilities, the tech high level technical ability which they had to implement that and become the team that they did. So I don't think it's an easy, you know. One, one or the other thing here, I think he, he helped them, he complimented them, but certainly the individual qualities which they had clearly helped him achieve what he did as well. Juventus will have to plan without Sami Khedira for tonight's Champions League tie with Atletico Madrid. The midfielder has been diagnosed with an irregular heartbeat and will be sidelined while he undergoes treatment. Khedira trained as normal on Tuesday and on Monday, but tests uncovered he was suffering from atrial arrhythmia. The condition causes an irregular and often abnormally fast heart rate and can lead to dizziness, shortness of breath and tiredness. The 31-year-old has made 15 appearances for Juve this season and played in their last two fixtures before this bout. The future of the Chelsea manager, Mauricio Sarri, continues to dominate the discourse. The Mirror write that he is on the brink. While the Times explains Sarri has one week to save his job, Chelsea reportedly considering <coughs> appointing assistant manager Gianfranco Sola as caretaker boss until the end of the season if they decide to part company with Sarri. Now, Andy Reid has rubbished the suggestion that Roy Keane doesn't have the temperament for management. The former Ireland captain is back in the dugout at Nottingham Forest, where he's serving as assistant to Martin O'Neill. In the final year with the Republic of Ireland set up, he had a high-profile fallout with Harry Arter, which led to the midfielder sitting out games for the boys in green. Reid, though, has launched an impassioned defence of Keane on TalkSport Radio. 
need to be mentally strong working with them and, and I don't see any problem with that you know people are, people say no well you can't treat players like that anymore well, you can't demand high standards you can demand high standards day in day out you know pass the ball properly 10 yard pass make sure it's done properly if there's tackle there to be made tackle do it properly everything do it properly on the training pitch every single pass I don't see anything wrong with that and if people can't deal with that then they need to work on their you know they need to work on, on, on their personalities like I, I presume that that's obviously the case when you're a manager or a coach in any team. Like I'm not sure what's that what he was like as a player as well in terms of even micromanaging things like a ten yard pass. It was just uh, Roy. Roy um, I don't remember Roy being particularly vocal in the international uh, squad in terms of the sessions. I don't remember Roy carrying himself in that respect being particularly vocal and demanding this, that, and the other. If anything, uh, the opposite a little bit. Uh, Roy in terms of Roy had maybe a few injuries along the way as well so he kind of would have managed himself a little bit when he came over the international squad in terms of we saw the picture up there me and him sitting in the in the dugout in terms of maybe many how he trained in terms of intensity uh, he trained that so I don't remember that in terms of Roy training with the international team but the, we spoke about it before I mean the general principle in terms of high standards yeah but I think it's how you get that information across in demanding a certain le a level um it, of performance in terms of training is fine but it's how you go about it in terms of the tone it's delivered there's one thing saying oh you that's not good enough you this that and you're the you're a disgrace boom 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 and then there's what lads come on we're better than this you're better than that you know come on, you need to raise your standards i believe so it's all about the approach getting into the player's head being a you know as most of the top managers are good psychologists as well so for me the argument isn't demanding high standards i think every coach manager does that Roy's no exception there in, in terms of managers demanding a certain level of performance in, 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 in training and games but in terms of uh, how you go about it how, how you go about getting into the minds of players and actually getting that type of uh, performance out getting that level of performance that's the real skill Do you buy into what Reid said in the same interview he said when he played with Keane he would get 1 or 2% from every single player on the pitch around him did you get 1 or 2% extra by just being in the same team as him? Um, I'm not too sure, uh, in all honesty. Roy was an inspirational uh, figure, and, and when he was on the pitch, I think you saw, uh, Owen spoke out about Van Dijk coming, coming back for the second leg in terms of the effect that's going to have around the team, seeing his presence on the pitch. So there was that with Roy on the international stage when, uh, when he was there. But, it, but in terms of him kind of being vocally kind of demanding and being very almost critical and uh, you know, very aggressive, in it, that's the way he was uh, on the pitch. I'm not necessarily sure. I'd agree with it totally in terms of that. Nestle got uh, a lot more out of me. And I think it, in some respects it can be quite intimidating. Now, it really talks about players who just have to accept and change their personalities. That's a very difficult thing to do, change your personality, mm. you know, at, at 20, 22, 23 uh, uh, years uh, of age. So I don't think I'd, I'd necessarily uh, agree with that. I think really you've got to, you, then you've got to kind of modify your approach a little bit. International football players a little bit battle hard and they can take it. So most players could take that kind of criticism and that demand. Uh, from Roy, we kind of understood where it was coming from. But players maybe maybe not as kind of battle hard, maybe a bit younger, uh, coming in into the squad, not as developed maybe em em emotionally. Maybe th that that's not easy uh, uh, to deal with. Somebody of Roy's stature, someone of his ilk, uh, being that uh, uh, demanding. You know, that's that, that's not an easy thing to to deal with. So I, I wouldn't be in in total agreement with it now. Darren, I better let you go do your day job. Thanks a million uh, for the update there. Uh, we're going to get into part one of our interview with Will Fleury. He's an Irish MMA fighter and he's got uh, an incredible philosophy really about defeat and about going for victory in combat sport. And he was speaking to us ahead of his fight at Bellator 217 in the three arena this Saturday night. Okay, so Will Fleury, you're very welcome back. Uh, I think it was last July you were in yeah. studio with us, or just before last July, uh, and you were going into Bellator 208. 214. 214. I think, oh, maybe it was. 203, actually. Maybe. 203, 203, sorry, sorry. sorry. In, in Rome last yeah. year. Uh, we're both wrong. Uh, yeah, way off. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're up against the Macedonian fighter, Amadovsky. Yeah. Uh, you were quite confident going into that fight. You were telling us how you were going to beat him. Uh, for people who might have missed that fight in Rome last year, tell us what happened. Um, I got knocked out in the first round basically and uh that was extremely disappointing obviously you know it was extremely frustrating from my point of view because look this was my opportunity this was like my coming out party nearly i felt like um and i feel like i got it all right in the camp you know physically everything went perfectly i was in very good shape I prepared as well like i'm not somebody who'd leave any stone unturned in that situation i felt like my preparation had been very good but i do feel like i let myself down on the night just with my attitude. How so? 
I kind of felt like I was entitled to win that fight. You know, I did. I looked at him. I saw his skill set. I was thinking, like, I'm a way better martial artist than this guy. And this is just like a celebration of how good a martial artist I am. So, look, the game doesn't work like that. And life doesn't work like that. You get out there and you take every opportunity that comes your way. I didn't feel vicious on the night. I didn't feel that fear, that kind of switched on, you know, primal instinct to just get rid of the guy. Because that was your first defeat. So uh, did yeah, you yeah. feel that primal instinct, that fear in all your previous fights? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. What's that like? Oh, it's overwhelming. Like, it's, it's that flight or fight response, you know, and it's the extreme of it because you're going to go out in front of everybody you know and it's all going to be exposed anyway. So there's all of those fears playing in your head and then it becomes, there's no flight anymore. It's just fight. Mm. So you just, and like, I love that period. Of, there's like that window 20 minutes before the fight. Everything just calms down in your mind and you're just like, okay, let's go. And I thrive in that. Like, I love that environment. Like, I love the pressure. You know, like, it's horribly uncomfortable building up to it. But then you get to that little window and you have that gap where it's like everything is quieted down. Now it's just your fight. I never really got to that point in Rome. And look, you know, I don't... Could I have put myself there? Could I have made myself more nervous before the fight? Yeah, probably. I could have thought about things and I could have done things slightly differently in that, like, couple of hours beforehand, but... Yeah, I think, like, you just have to have a natural kind of fear in you because there's four-ounce gloves that can be over, especially with bigger guys. It can be over very quickly. Like, it doesn't matter how good you are. And when does that fear usually come? Is this when you're about to walk into the cage? Is this early on in the way day? Before, way before. Oh, yeah, like, as in, look, the weeks leading up to it. Right. Like, yeah. Um, but the real, like, the stomach-turning kind of stuff, yeah, probably the Wednesday of fight week, okay. all that sort of stuff starts, and then it goes away 20 minutes before the fight. And presumably it dissipates further when you start a fight pretty well and you have your opponent pinned up against the cage, which is what happened against yeah, Lewandowski. Yeah, and I'm like, look, that's another factor. I think I kind of switched off because I just the takedown was so easy. The flow, I was even listening to like Mike Goldberg commentating on the fight and talking about how I trained with Johnny Jitsu and... You could hear this wild... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And even like I was able to, like I was talking to him and the boss afterwards and I was able to recall his commentary like um, so it was bizarre it was really surreal like but look you get in you get it done and if you don't you have no excuse and I have no excuse it's incredibly frustrating I messed up with my attitude on the night I felt like as good a martial artist when I woke up the next morning I know I'm still a world class fighter I know I can still go out there and beat anyone on my day so it's just about getting the opportunity like and that's probably been the most frustrating thing getting the opportunity to redeem that and it's taken so long well, can you put into words what that feels like when you've got the upper hand initially, it turns around, and then all of a sudden, it's fight over? It's fight over before you know it. Like my first, you don't have time to think about it. Just like the first thing I knew was Dan Mergliola was putting his arm around me. And I said, did that just happen? And I could see him running around celebrating. And he was like, yeah, buddy. And there was just shock, complete shock. And then I went back to the dressing room and I was just like, right. Can I see it? Like, because I wanted to just see a clip of it, you know. And I'd remembered, like, the takedown. He got back up. I could have trapped that inside wrist. All these little sequences in my head, like, the, you know, you're super switched on mentally at that point in time. And all of that was there. And then it was just those couple of seconds and it was just over. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just bizarre. It's and when you get to watch it back initially, what are you thinking? Why is my hand down? Right. So I threw a teep and my hand was here. And he came over the top and he hit. Now, we followed up really well. So he landed like three in quite quick succession. But if my hand was up and I was framing, and I drilled that loads, you know, for yeah. teep. Presumably yeah. it's fairly basic. Yeah, it's not something that, you know, you should be leaving a window for. The thing is, when it comes to MMA, especially compared to boxing, the, the, the thing that's kind of thrown out there is, well, people are fighting a lot more. It's more regular. So the positive is when you're an MMA fighter, you get to redeem yourself pretty quickly, except in your case. Yeah. What happened? Uh, I was told originally I might be getting a card in America in kind of October time. So I was all guns blazing for that. I was, you know, mad to get back in there. Um, and then that got pushed back. And then they said, look, we're going to put you on the Dublin card. You're an Irish guy. They planned the Dublin card for December originally. For some reason that fell through. So when I found out that Dublin card wasn't happening, I was extremely frustrated, obviously. But uh, they rescheduled for February, and here we are. But it's been 
look, I've all like, you know, if they'd given me the opportunity to fight two weeks later, I would have been in there. And it's incredibly frustrating when you're just denied that chance to redeem yourself. Like, yeah, it must be incredibly frustrating just to like have that lingering over you for months and months and months and not being able to put it right. Yeah, you can sense it there. Even without listening to him, his body language as he's as he's talking to have to wait. What's that? Six months ago? When was it? When was the seven the months? Yeah. Se seven months. That's absolutely huge. I mean, generally speaking, um, you know, football and environment that you know that bad defeat, that bad individual performance, very quickly. Uh, get, it, get it out of your system. We talk about a midweek game, you got to wait. Sometimes you think, oh, i got to wait a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, to, get it, to get it out of your whole week, this is a whole, like, uh, seven months, particularly when you know you've come out of a fight and you can sense it there, Will. He just he was talking about his kind of defensive technique. Uh, he was obviously disappointed in himself. Just amazing, it? Just the basics let you down. In football, is the same. Most sports, I think, are the same. Even at the highest level, sometimes the very basics you just don't do for some reason that kind of really grades at you. You sense his, uh, his frustration there, but Totti spoke very well, like you know what I mean. Very intelligent uh, uh, speaker, and uh, you suspect like when he do, if he does get that opportunity, which is coming down the road, he's uh, he's going to take. He's not going to pass it up. We're just going to play another quick clip from that interview, and as we say, after a seven-month layoff, he's hoping to make a big impact at Bellator two one seven this weekend. You have the sound of a man who's itching to get back in there. Oh yeah. Yeah, like as in, this thing, it's an incredible opportunity for me now, but it's taken so long to come about. Mm. So all the train, like, look, you can't, you know, nobody can keep you down on yourself. And I kind of feel like I haven't done, like, I haven't let myself get disheartened by this. I haven't let myself go away from this. Like, I've been in there. I've been training nonstop. I've been ready nonstop. Now it's finally happening, like. Yeah. So I just feel like, okay. The potential here is huge. Like it, it clearly is, and the potential as well from, I guess, uh, an MMA standpoint within Ireland is huge as well. Which I do want to touch on. It's Tree Arena, February twenty third. The question I have now, after everything you said, is: Are you feeling that fear now? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Got it back. Yeah, yeah. No, it's there. Why? But what, like, what, why is now different? To what, what happened last summer? I think I expected to win so much. Like, as in, look, it's pretty rare to go undefeated for as long as I did. Like, I went fourteen fights, you know, seven amateur, and then I had like two in the um, reality series and what, four pro. So I was at 13 fights um, undefeated and like none of those fights were close. I dominated all of them. Like, you know, it was pretty consistent of just like never really been in any serious trouble in those fights. I'd be quite smart even with my sparring sessions. Like I very rarely get myself in bad positions and I'm good at just recognizing where I can beat somebody. I saw lots that I could beat in this guy. And then I, and I took that opportunity early as well. So I, like, I got that takedown easy. And I just thought, oh, this is easy. You know, you're, you know. And there was, a, there was that expectation of victory. You mm. felt it, like entitlement, which is like, a terrible thing. Because like, you got there because you worked that hard. You know, you are who you are because of the work you've put in. So I kind of got away from that attitude. And I was like, no, you're Will Fleury. You're the guy who just shows up and wins. You're this incredible fighter. And it's not. You're a guy who works unbelievably hard. Yeah. It's very interesting because mo as I think any sports person really, now it mostly happens in the fight game that people are very confident in telling everybody how good they are in terms of telling people how they expect to win. And the reason why everybody does that is because it works. That positive psychology works. So I'm sensing that there is a very thin line here between expectation and entitlement yeah, when it comes yeah. to being a fighter. Would you say that you kind of crossed over to the entitlement line? Yeah, so like, it's something like, look, I grew up watching Monster Rugby and, you know, I kind of love that attitude of like, it's just the honesty of your effort mm. and the honesty of like, you going out there and putting it all on the line and that's what's going to get you over there. But there is a psychology within just being like, no, I'm better. I'm actually better than you and I can do things better than you can and I'm training in a better environment than you are and, you know, just what I do, you won't be able to match. There's a positivity within that, but there is, like you said, there's like, when does it become an entitlement? And when does it start to seem like it's kind of a thing that's stopping you? Like, I think if you can have that and still have the fear, it's a good thing. Like, how do you manage that is the question then, isn't it? Something I've struggled with, like, obviously, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, I suppose it's that case of, like, you still have to be super aware that this game, and like I said, I won so much, I probably switched off to the fact that defeat was an option, like, because yeah. every time I'd fought in my life, it had been big build up, really nervous, great buzz afterwards. You feel amazing, everybody's congratulating you, everything's going well in your life. 
This time around, it was like, oh, great build up, great buzz, all that, and then boom. But like, that's the other thing I don't even think of, actually. It's the idea of just missing that buzz of victory. You haven't had it for a while just because oh, yeah. of the long layoff. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the fight before. What are we talking about? 12 months at this point? Uh, March 2nd March was close the last enough. fight. Yeah, so not far off. Yeah. It's been nearly a year since Le- I've had a win. 11 months without the sweetest yeah. thing in sport. Yeah. And it, like, that feeling, it's incredible. Like, as in, it's just all the positive brain chemistry you've ever had <laughs> flooding into you. Like, and it's... I think, like, you know, it's one of the main reasons people fight, like, because it is, there's that such a massive wave of relief, then a wave of joy, and then you meet people, like, who are so happy for you, and it's just, it's all super positive, like, and then even, like, one of the worst things about losing as well, like, I don't feel that differently about myself, I know who I am, and I know what I'm, like, capable of, and I know that I can go out and make a good career out of this still, but it's the people who kind of invested in you, and the people who you feel like you've let down, that's kind of the most horrible part and you meet those people over the next couple of weeks and mm. you know it's, they're kind of like giving you a smile and a bit of like but you're like oh. it's tough you to know, see it's horrible like it really is and like I think you know you who do are those people in your life sorry who are, who are those people in your life friends fans yeah. like you know people I meet in the gym and people I've trained with over the years um, a lot of like you know the amount of goodwill I had going into that fight and the amount of people who were like told me, oh, like, you know, I love your attitude, it's inspiring, it's getting me through this, whatever. And then you feel like you've gone and screwed that and, you know, you let everybody down in a way. Is there a guilt attached to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, the thing is, I, th- I feel like it was the guilt of that attitude because, like, the work was done. I didn't let myself down. Like, you know, even I look at all the numbers that I was putting in at the time and the training sessions I was doing and I was documenting everything, but, like, it was just that mental switch off of like, sure, you, you show up, you win, you do this thing. But it's easy to sit here and say that. I wanted to have that opportunity to get out and prove it again. Like, you know, show, look, I'm someone who puts in the work to perform properly. Let me get in there and perform properly. Like, Yeah, Will Flurry there, and you can watch uh, the full video on our YouTube channel. We also spoke about the importance of Bellator Sky Sports Deal, clickbait in mixed martial arts, and the challenge of making a living from prize fighting. You can head on over to youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Rui O'Connor is with us in studio next on OTB AM to chat rugby. Before that, uh, let's hear from Sean O'Brien. He was discussing his decision to leave Leinster yesterday afternoon. You know, I, I never thought I was probably going to be in this situation, but, you know, that's that's uh, the way it goes sometimes, and that's the environment we're in in, in, in professional sports. But um, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought too much about it, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, that's just, it, all, it all happened very fast. Did you, did you have an option to say, or, or was that kind of out of hands? Yeah, it was kind of out of my, out of my hands. Um, but, uh, you know, again, like, I'm regardless of what options are there, I think... You know, I made the decision based on a, on a lot of stuff for me as well, personally. Um, you know, a new challenge, um, new environment, um, new competition. So they were all things that that um, excited me and um, where I want to test myself in a different environment. You know, I've given a lot to, to Leinster over the last um, 10, 12 years. So uh, time to move on and, and do something new. What has it meant for you to, to wear that new jersey's for? Yeah, it's been incredible. You know, it's um, it's been uh, probably a few tears shed over over the last few months thinking about all this. And and when you do make your final decision, it's um, you know it's a tough place to to just I suppose at the end of it all, you're you're packing your bag and and you're you're walking out the door and uh, moving to a different club. So it's you know it's, it hasn't been that easy or anything, but it's it is what it is. And um, you know what I mean? Again, you just you back you back yourself to go over there and do a job. Yeah, Sean O'Brien there speaking yesterday about his departure from Leinster. Rory O'Connor, you're very welcome. Thanks, Sean. What do you reckon about that, about the possibility of Sean O'Brien potentially wearing a green jersey after moving to London Irish? I think it's unlikely. I think he kind of had to say what he said, but the, unless there's a sea change in policy from Andy Far- Farrell when he comes in, and you know, it's said it's an RFU policy, but really the coach sets the, 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 those kind of policies. It's, you know, they're very influential in these things. But while Sean, you know, a 25, 26-year-old Sean O'Brien at the peak of his powers you might bend the rules for, like they do with Johnny Sexton, but I think at the beginning of a new World Cup cycle, when he's 32, you know, he turned 33 during the next Six Nations, I find it unlikely that they would go and and and, you know, bring him back in when they could be investing in someone who could, who would play a role, like someone like Dan Levy or Josh Van der Fleer, who, in fairness, are not really investments anymore. They're they're top line internationals themselves. So, and mm-hmm. um, I I don't like the idea of not picking the best Irish players to play for Ireland. But I understand the policy, and Schmidt outlined it last month that 
They fear, you know, it's, it's quite obvious, they fear that if they start playing a Sean O'Brien, Simon Zebo when they're away, more will, more will go away. That maybe isn't back in their own system quite as much as they could because I think the carrots of staying here and being minded and, you know, being able to, available for every training session are, um, you know, are strong in their own right. And, and, you know, playing for Leinster has earned Sean O'Brien four European Cup, well, three European Cup medals. He wasn't, um, I think he missed two of the finals anyway because of injury. But, you know, he's had an unbelievable career here. So it's not as if you're limiting your, your ambition trophies-wise you're probably limiting your capacity to earn, but I think at 32, he knows that this is the last big payday. He pretty much said that himself yesterday. Um, he's going to remain available for selection. You know, he might be a break glass in ca case of emergency kind of call, mm. but I can't see Andy Farrell going, going and getting him, despite the fact that he is Sean O'Brien. And when Sean O'Brien is at his best, he's one of the best players in the world. Sorry, Rory, is there an argument for saying uh, you're, you're actually uh, extending your uh, rugby playing career by, by playing within the system over here for one of the provinces in terms of how your games are managed? So in terms of the financial aspect, yeah, you could you could uh, pitch up abroad, England, France, wherever it is, and in the short term, earn more money in terms of salary, but in terms of long longevity, in terms of your career, in terms of the games played, how they're managed uh, over here, uh, there's an argument for saying, well, that will actually extend your career, and, and by virtue of the fact you potentially earn over the length of that. There definitely is because you you're, you are well managed and you're giving weekends off. But at the same time, he, if he's not playing top line in Test rugby, which is where the game is at its most mm. intense, and they're playing like 10, 11, 12 Test matches a year, well, they probably play play about eight really because you get you know you wouldn't play against the USA's and play teams like that. You you take those out of your out of your um, your schedule. Suddenly you're playing club matches, which are slightly slower. Yeah. Um, getting that recovery, get, get, get a bit of recovery. Like he did, he, I don't think the recovery is as good because you're not getting the you're not getting rested for club matches, mm. but you're probably getting bigger windows where you can just take off the international breaks if you're not picked. So, yeah. and I think London Irish, you'd imagine, would be clever and not roll them out for every you know away match, every every kind of you know challenge. They'll be in Challenge Cup next year, yeah. so I, I think there definitely is an argument for that. In that the Irish players are essentially managed, so they, they are a few. They have the best medical care. They are centrally managed, as in their, their minutes are watched, their, their energy levels are watched, and as soon as they dip, the call comes from the IRFU to Leinster, he's not playing this weekend. That will be gone, but at the same time, I think at 32, 33, 34, just playing club rugby suits players, because it's just not quite as, as quick, not quite as hard. Um, so I think like he signed a three-year deal. They've, they've backed him for three years, which for, with his injury record is incredible. At the same time, he says he's lightly raced. Because in the last two years he's barely played a game. He's just had big breaks. So um, yeah, I, I think staying within the Irish system is probably the best thing to do for your long, long the longevity of your career. The reality was there wasn't an offer of the caliber that London Irish were offering on the table. That big jump already in terms, not overly interesting in terms of what the lads earn, but you know, obviously the financial package <coughs> is better. It's probably kept them on par. Is, there's, a, there's a jump, and then there's a significant jump twice, three times in terms of what he uh, what he can earn back here, like and I think, it, I think it keeps him on what he was around what he was on as a, as a frontline Ireland player, which he was on a central oh. RFU contract, which wasn't on the table this time. And I think once that wasn't on the table. He knew at the stage of the career he was at that if he wanted to keep earning what he earned, he, he would go to London Irish. Where, you know. where is the line currently at? So in terms of the threshold for what standard you have to be at to get a call when you're playing abroad, is Johnny Sexton the only exception that there will be? Or is there somebody currently in the squad that they could See, do the same thing? I think Johnny Sexton would remain, even with Joey Carberry's emergence, I think if Johnny Sexton was at Racing, they would probably still be picking him. But it ran into difficulties. I'm not sure. I think if Conor Murray had gone... There would have been a definitely a case for Conor Murray because he's so preeminent in his position and he's so influential in the way Ireland play, same way Sexton was. But I think back rows, you know, for all that they're really valuable commodities and really like, you know, Sean O'Brien is a star, there are other back rows who can do it. Like Ireland won a Grand Slam without Sean O'Brien last year, so they've proven that they can do it without him. So, you know, I think he's struggling. I think if Johnny Sexton or Conor Murray even now went down, I know we beat, they beat the All Blacks without Conor Murray, I still think they would probably, you know, break the rule for, for Conor Murray, but I think it's really specialist positions. Um, players of real influence would be, but I think they learned from the Sexton um, experience when he kept getting injured playing for Racing or, or coming back and missed windows of preparation. Maybe maybe a different coach who doesn't rely as much on preparation as Joe Schmidt. I know all coaches rely on preparation, but Joe Schmidt relentlessly drills, set plays, and set moves, everything is, is called from the playbook. Mm. So if you miss a week of that training because you're off playing in France, and we've seen yeah. Parise got concussed this week and Finn Russell got concussed this week playing in France, and now they're going to miss internationals for their for national teams. So there's that risk. But also, if you miss a, a week of training, Rob Carney missed a week of training in, in, in Portugal, 
missed out on the England game. So I think ideally you will be, you know, th- th- yeah, there is about two or three lad- players who, who they would make a, an exception for, but in the current regime, I don't think they really would. Rory, how would that be perceived, the interesting one for me, by the other players within the squad in terms of the exceptions made for Johnny Sexton? Sess- you're saying potentially Conor Morty would be another one of those. That's the key for me. What would be the exception to other players? Would they accept that? Or would there be a little bit of discontent, uh, a little bit of few players a little bit irked in terms of the exceptions being made for, for other players because that's absolutely key I mean the, the group's so strong so together would the players accept that? I, I think the only people that would have an issue with it potentially are their direct rivals and I think the direct rivals to Johnny Sexton at the time knew that they weren't at the level that they could challenge him right. so I think it is generally accepted you know okay. you, you don't it, that's it huge. works. I mean, for me, that's the, mo- the most. In yeah, the, I think within the dressing oh, room it is. I mean, I don't think there's a massive clamour within the dressing room to say bring Simon Zebo back, mm. even though Simon Zebo would be a very popular member of the dressing room, and I think would still, although he's not playing particularly well right now. He, I just I watched him on, on Sunday and it wasn't a, a great game from him, but I think he still could add to this the setup. But I think there is a, a rec- there is a recognition. Well, they're probably taking a sacrifice by committing. Like not all of them will get a contract abroad, but they're all probably sacrificing something to stay within the system and play here. So they recognise that they're being rewarded for that as well. Now, the exception to the rule, when it's Sexton, I think you understand that. I think if they started breaking it for everyone, they'd all start considering their options and contract time would become much more tricky for the IRFU in the provinces. Yeah, let's talk about uh, the Italy game this weekend. It's next up uh, for Ireland on Sunday. And Conor O'Shea was on off the ball with Joe yesterday afternoon and here he is about speaking with Joe Schmidt over coffee. Yeah, well, I did it certainly last year in Ireland because we had a week off and I stayed over for a couple of days uh, straight after the game and arranged to meet him. It mightn't be as easy to meet him straight after the game yeah. this time unless he wants to come to Rome for a coffee. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe he will. He maybe might, he'll yeah. Off. But Nanis and Joe, we've been, as I said, he's the first to say that it didn't just all happen with him. There's a lot of people that worked uh, to, to make it happen over a number of years. But uh, I think Irish people, I, I thought the reaction to the England loss was nothing short of... Uh, histrionics and laughable to be honest absolutely laughable uh, the, the, there's a divine right to win any game of rugby when you're playing against top teams and when you're playing against the likes of the Vunapolas and two laggies in full flow and then to say that they were beaten out of sight when it's actually a game side on fine margins but that's the world we live in mm. uh, we've been very very lucky as a country to have Joe um, uh, Joe Smith and uh, I don't know what he'll do afterwards I'll certainly be picking his brains for hopefully many many years to come the fact that he's, uh, uh, he's, he's, um, he's living close to my parents or to my mother now uh, I'll always have an eye on him Yeah good stuff from Conor O'Shea there yesterday and you can get the full interview uh, on YouTube like Conor O'Shea himself is, is worth talking about starting to see some green shoots with this Italian team I know they're missing Sergio Priest this weekend which yeah. is a hell of a, hell of a blow They're certainly seeing green shoots with the Ita- Italian game there's been improvements from the ground up which I think long term will benefit them, but right, you know, the, he's front of the house, he's, he's, he kind of is a director of rugby and a coach all rolled into one, and he has gone over there with this kind of, you know, he, he ran the Institute of Sport in the UK, he ran Harlequins uh, as a director of rugby, and he, that part of it I think he's gotten really right, but the front of house stuff is is where you're judged, and every, you know, every year we look at Italy once a year, because Ireland are playing them, and, he, and then suddenly you look back at the record, and he hasn't won a Six Nations game, which is a difficult thing to do, but it's still... Remarkable that he hasn't been able to pull off one scalp. There's been a couple of close sh- close shaves, but there's no real. It looks like the pack are pulling away from them rather than he's getting closer with this Italian team. Prese is out this weekend, but he's still the most recognisable face in the team. I'm not sure if he's still the best player anymore, but he's still uh, you know a huge influence on the uh, on the whole thing at, at 36 or 37, whatever he is now. You just wonder whether he he almost needs to after the World Cup step up and just take control of the whole organisation and allow someone to run the team because the team needs, I think the team needs that, that bit of TLC that, 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 that maybe he is giving it, I don't know, I'm possibly being unfair to him, but I mean, you've seen the clubs are doing better, the under 20s are doing well, underage the whole way down, they're investing in, in the player pathway, all that stuff, but you know, that's David Nusifora's job in the Irish system, Joe Schmidt's job is just the national team, now he helps out in other parts of it, but how long can Italy go on not winning any Six Nations mm-hmm. games? I mean, they beat the, the next best European get team, Georgia, in November, which almost keeps the relegation thing, you know, down a little bit. But 
you know. They but you can only judge we're already in any sport. I, I, I get fed up with this. Uh, you hear in uh, football in terms of oh, he's only hasn't won a game in eight games or etc. You've made I know you've made a point about he hasn't won a game, but you can only judge a manager or a coach in terms of the players you have available to you. Yeah. And in terms of getting you're getting very the very best out of the team collectively. I know the tactical setup comes into how you set up the team, whatever defensively, offensively, and all that, and even individually get more out of players individual work but you can only assess a manager on what he's got available yeah. to are you saying there's a you know, huge amount more than maybe the, the Italian uh, rugby team are you saying there's more to come from that you look at that team and think uh, uh, I, I would think there's 10, probably 20% somebody could tap in there it's hard to put a number on it but uh, there are times when you watch them and you think they could do better you know that I, I think they are the worst set of players in the tournament I, like, I don't think you're, you're completely right there and I think by you know if you were to do if you were to money ball it they, were, they are going to finish bottom every year but there have been times where they've just fallen apart in games. There have been times where they've come close and just not had the composure to go and win the game. And just as a coach, you just need that one win would give him a bit of breathing space for a while because I'm, I'm not calling for his head. I, you know, I think he's doing a good job and I've always been impressed with Conor O'Shea. Mm. But I think to keep the crowd with you, and for all that your, your underage teams are doing well and for all that your, um, your, your, your provinces are doing well, there's still going to be 60 or 70,000 people in the Stadio Olimpico on Saturday and you, or on Sunday and you need to keep them with you and on side. Mm-hmm. And you just need to give them something every so often. You know, like whether it's a, a good performance against Ireland or a win over France, the average margin of defeat against Ireland, a team that they would traditionally rattle one in every four games or so, under, Connor, under Joe Schmidt, it's been 35 points. And that includes a seven-point game in the World Cup. You know, it's getting more. It's getting. They, they seem to be getting further and further away from the likes of Ireland. Now Ireland have figured out a way of beating them. But I think for Connor, if he if he wants to stay in that role beyond this World Cup, I, he just needs to scalp. He, he needs to one day where they catch someone on a bad day and they play above themselves. And it just seems to be something that they haven't been able to muster in the last while. That sounds like a mentality thing. You were talking about kind of players, uh, uh, kind of the team falling apart. That sounds like a kind of mindset amongst the players where it's kind of a lack of confidence. You know, things go badly during the game and or here we go again, that type of mentality. So sometimes, yeah, I agree what you're saying in terms of a victory, a surprise victory against a, a team of notes. Suddenly the whole dynamic yeah. can change. Suddenly players are listening again in terms of listening to the manager now there's a little bit more belief yeah. in, in terms I, of what he's saying and, and that can be a bit, a bit of a sea change. He appears to have the dressing room. I mean, everything we hear out of, out of the camp is very positive about him. I just think that he has such a big job. He almost needs to to leave this team to someone else and, and grow the overall thing so that it all feeds into the one the one thing and that the, the, the main team can grow because they they are coming from such a low base and they are so far off the rest of their rival rival countries. But it, you know, Scotland have shown it can be done with two teams, but it's gonna take an awful long time. And it's almost like he has too big a job and he has always been seen as more of a director of rugby, you know, more of an organizer than a than a hands on coach. Some it's just as you know, I, you know, we dip in in and out of Italian rugby. I'm not claiming to be an expert by any means, but I mean, it's four or five years since they won a Six Nations game, which is an awful long time to go in one tournament. And you'd wonder how that's affected the mindset. It's what, how they how they approach this weekend against a team that just hammered them every time they mm. played against them. That's got to be soul destroying. Yeah, it has to be. Uh, from Joe Schmidt's perspective, then this weekend, I think the general consensus is that there's not going to be much experimentation with the team, Rory, or, or what's your read? We're still kind of trying to figure this out. It's it's uh, Joe Schmidt didn't really do much post match in, in Murrayfield. We didn't quite get onto this topic. You know, it's it's an awkward. It, so it was difficult to get a sense of where he was, he sat with it. It's a really awkward game because it's a week they had a week break beforehand, week break afterwards, and a couple of players in key positions who you probably would like to rotate for this game in an ideal world because they're the positions that probably the least depth haven't really got any form or you know are, are still playing their way into form. So you're talking halfbacks, halfbacks in particular. You know, so if you if you leave Johnny Sexton out, he's played 100 minutes since December 29th, and then he's going into France and Wales. You know, we presume he play against France and Wales, and. It, even with the World Cup in mind, I think they need to finish this tournament strong with their best players playing. I wonder if he's going to play a stronger team here or like you know two thirds of a team or three quarters of a team this week, and then do another little change for France and keep just changing little bits and do it gradually, which probably won't satisfy some people. But I think there's a there's definitely a need to get a lot of le- you know a lot of games and legs, and even the fact that there's a couple of really strong second rows come back into the the camp this week. You know, did they get straight out there or they, how, you know how are they after? Pretty long layoffs. I mean, there's so much stuff that we don't know because it's it's how players are performing in training this week because because we just haven't seen them play. That that'll all feed into it. The one thing we do know is that John Ryan is going to play mm. because Andrew Porter's been packed off to play for Leinster for the week, which just shows that maybe it'll be the bench that changes up. That you know players will be given a bit of exposure. 
whether that's enough if, say, Conor Murray goes down in the first game of the World Cup and suddenly John Cooney or, or, you know, is, is called upon, he's had three minutes in, two, you know, in each of the last two games, I think he needs at least 20, 25 minutes in Rome. But I think Murray will start. And I'd be edging at this point with no real inside knowledge that I think he possibly will go with Sexton because Carberry got nearly an hour last time and played really well. So maybe Carberry goes against France. I don't know. You know, it's, it's, mm. I, think, I think there is a need to get um, minutes in legs that... You know, I think if Italy was, if they swapped Italy and France, they go full balls against France and then rest up against Italy. But because this is we- this week's rest coming as well, I'm not sure we're going to see a huge amount of change. I could be completely wrong, but the scope for change is not as it's not there as much as I think he'd like. Yeah, there is also the situation, and Gordon Darcy, I know, touches on it in his column this morning in the Irish Times, talking about Ireland perhaps finding that flow state again. That he said that in the last season under Michael Checa at Leinster, that they were too wound up with the idea of finding that perfection, that their success, they felt they had to make another step up. And yeah. instead of actually just enjoying that flow state and pursuing this flow state, they kind of lost a bit of that. And there is a certain element of similarity with that, particularly from the halfbacks' performances so far this year. And it may just be rustiness, it may just be a lack of minutes, and they just need more time in the pitch. Yeah, and it's funny they talk about the perfect game all the time you know it's it's, it's, some, it's almost like it is seems to be something that it slips into their public discourse so I think it's something that they talk about behind the scenes that they kind of say you don't ever play a perfect game but you know during 2018 they got pretty close to as, as good a game as Ireland have played in any era mm. um, and I think when you lose that form a little bit that's got to have question marks in, in you know just just invites a bit of doubt into your head and um you know, if if you were so dominant and so on top of every facet of, of, of everything that you did before Christmas and suddenly you aren't after Christmas and people are getting on your back, as Conor O'Shea said, the reaction to the English game was strong, which I think losing to England will always be. Um, you know, that's, that's, that, that is going to put doubts in, in your, your mind. And then for Conor Murray coming back after a long layoff and not really, you know, still scratching around a little bit of form, I thought he was better against Scotland. I think, I don't know, Kenny you, you has better experience at this, but I think you need to play your way into form sometimes. And your coach yeah. has got to keep, you know, even though people outside might be doubting you, he knows that if you play alongside the guy that you're used to and you haven't done it for a while, you just need to be minutes on the pitch to, to get back there. And I think there is an investment for all the people who want to invest in new people. These are players that if they're fit, they're going to be, you know, on the pitch for Ireland at the World Cup. And this is really the only window they have to get to play together. So like, I it, think it's funny, actually, on that point, And like, Kenny, this might be something for you. Like Kevin De Bruyne was saying that exact thing this morning in the paper. It's just like that little element, that edge is just gone. You just need to be on the pitch. You just need to get minutes down, no matter how good you are or no matter how, uh, how good your cardio is, even in terms of fitness. It's actually a mental thing. It's just being that little bit sharper and playing your way into form, as Rui says, Kenny, is a real thing. Yeah, but I don't think it's a, a huge factor. Now you're talking about, say, say take sex and there for an example in terms of just minutes needs minutes on the pitch but surely that's not a factor in terms of uh, the World Cup which is some some time away after the Six Nations over plenty of time for him to get those type of competitive minutes under his belt particularly obviously playing uh, for Leinster so I would have thought the argument for actually bringing those players on the periphery of the squad in and just getting minutes on the pitch just in terms for them to feel part of it in terms of co- their confidence levels to rise for them to be more comfortable in the environment if yeah. those injuries arrive at the World Cup I would have thought for me that would be a more important factor than potentially Conor Murray or talk about Johnny Sexton experienced players who yeah might need the, the minutes at this moment of time and if we were actually undefeated in the Six Nations actually going with a chance to win it I could understand the argument would become a little bit stronger but with the defeat to England obviously that's yeah. pushed that to the side is it really an argument in terms of the World Cup in terms of the minutes fe- they get over the next couple of games surely I think that's he, not I think he fears a loss of momentum Yeah, I think he fears that if, if he changes too much and they, they end up losing one or two of those last two games, which was, looks less likely that France are so poor that they come out of this with their kind of all their, you know, not all their good work, but you know, all, that body of work in 2018 undermined by a loss of momentum. And he does trust his big players more than other coaches. Not like all coaches, like, you know, have their leaders and, and, and that sort of thing. But Schmidt does go back to the same kind of group of, of key players all the time. So there, if there was one criticism of him, it's that he is too reliant on them. And I just try, you're trying to second guess him. I think he will invest a bit of time in Carberry in the next couple of weeks, but I think Sexton's. I think he. I think he wants to win those last two games really well. So there, maybe there's not. But I think if you rest Sexton for this one, that denudes your chance of being able to do that in the last two games. It's really tricky. Like it's, mm. I think he'd love to have had Italy second and just changed nearly the whole team 
and then gone into this and yeah. just had the same same team for all three. Yeah, definitely. But, yeah, it depends whether he's willing to, to kind of you know sacrifice things a little bit. Mm, like so, we expect a team probably Friday it doesn't change things Friday, obviously yeah. for for a Sunday game. The other thing we wanted to touch on uh, ahead of this weekend was a couple of cross pollination stories that we've seen over the last couple of days at Leinster. You had Alex Mack from the Atlanta Falcons uh, in the camp, which is an interesting one. Like I, I think Stuart Lancaster and Dan Quinn, the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, are, are good mates. I think uh, from re- recollection, Dan Quinn actually invited Lancaster into the Falcons camp at one stage a couple of years ago and then of course you had uh, the England camp this week and Johnny May talking about John Terry's visit and saying that there is comparisons between the Pete Jose Mourinho Chelsea team and this current England team when it comes to the leadership group and the focus of training Rui. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. like I'm not sure do you go along uh, with you that. You had uh, Doug Heldert on the Cork. Oh yes of course. Hurling, and I think um, Johnny, Holland. Johnny Holland was beside him yeah so I mean I, I don't know why Alex Mack was there the other day I, I presume it's all coaching badges stuff I think it's all, you know, they, they facilitate these visits, you know, we've seen Roy Keane in with the All Blacks a couple of years ago. Um, there's a lot of bluster about this English team, isn't there? Like, when England start going well, there's a lot of stuff starts coming out, and, you, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't be long losing you. Um, the English, <laughs> like, uh, like, Johnny May's the best winger in the world suddenly, and, and you know, the, uh, they're quite happy to gobble up these lines and, and reproduce them, I suppose, but we were probably insufferable last year when Ireland weren't going well. Rightly so. I mean... You know, I presume Johnny Ter- John Terry's there to learn a bit about coaching from Eddie Jones. I don't think he's there to inspire the, the Lionheart spirit in the, in the team, but you never know. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know, did you, would you have many kind of I think it's in? A, I think it can be overplayed, this one. This has always been around, you're right, as part of your football, I've done my pro license and stuff, yeah, you'd be, uh, you have to go to di- maybe a different type of environment to set a Royal right, Pathé season and this, that and the other, yeah, but I've always, all, I've always thought it was a little bit overplayed, you hear managers kind of get the sack, well I'm going to travel now, I'm going to go and, ex- you know, I'm going to spend a week with Guardiola or, or the All Blacks and, and stuff like that, get a totally different perspective, never quite buy it. <laughs> nice holiday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be honest with you, I think in terms of John Teddy as a, as a, a football person going into a rugby environment, for me I think there's more to learn from me going into a rugby environment than there is someone from, say, Eddie Jones uh, turning up at a, a Premier League club or a Championship club. Because I just, in, term, in terms of how rugby teams, how they operate in terms of preparation, and generally always have done, in terms of how the different units operate, I know it's a different game, kind of, yeah, scrum, line out as obvious, disparities there, not so much in football, but in, in terms of how they prepare uh, the individual units and, and things like that. For me as a footballer, there'd be more to learn going into that type of environment. And Johnny May spoke about the Chelsea team, oh, oh, Terry Sand was some big leaders, in, but rugby has always had those. I mean, it's not, rugby traditionally has always had those real leaders. Not that the sport has kind of moved on uh, over the last 10, 15 years in the professional area, but there's always been, for me, yeah. Rugby has always had those people in the dressing room. That's how it struck me in terms of big leaders. Forget about the captain, but half a dozen more people, a real personality and very vocal, who had you know, real leadership qualities. I think it's one area that the England team probably could develop, though. I mean, Owen Farrell is quite clearly the team. You know, he's, he, he is the, the embodiment of that, that kind of... You know, he's Martin Johnson and Johnny Wilkinson rolled into one a little bit, but apart from him, you'd wonder if they came under a bit of pressure. So, like, Eddie Jones has throughout this time with England brought people in from the outside he's had you know the Georgian team in for scrummaging practice he's had Australian coaches in uh, it's, nearly every week they've had some sort of a kind of a, trying to get an edge he's always trying to bring in other stuff to try and get an edge and in fairness John Terry like sometimes we dismiss him but like his career was incredible so a lot of those players would have probably grown up watching yeah, him so, I'm not talking it, about John Terry in particular I'm yeah. just talking about generally a, a football player going in there and I'd always think oh, say, say myself uh, walking into that type of environment I'd be thinking I've, I've got nothing to say to these players like I mean it, look, you're talking about the attention the details Smith how kind of well drilled they are in all facets of the game I'd be Myself, I'd be almost embarrassed walking into that dressing room in terms of I've really got nothing to say uh, to these to these players. Like they're so meticulously uh, prepared, it's, it's it's ridiculous. Like that's what I'm saying. If anything, you're 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 poking your head in, looking around, thinking, "Wow, this is pretty amazing. What I can take, from, what can I take from this?" Mm, yeah, it's certainly an interesting one, and I'm sure there'll be more chat on that as uh, the next couple of weeks progress. See who Eddie Jones comes up with next. Who does he put out of his sleeve <laughs> to bring into England training? Uh, just before we finish up, just to let you know, over the next few weeks we'll be building up to Cheltenham with a couple of very special off-air shows in association with Bulmers. Our next show is coming up this Thursday night on the 21st of February. Jarlath Regan will be there with us on the night alongside Jer, Brian Cooper, Johnny Ward, Kate Harrington, ITV Racing presenter Ollie Bell, plus Paul Carberry and Vol. 
Rogue Williams will be there. There's also live music as well from Smash Hits. This is an exclusive off-air event, so the only way to enjoy it is to be there on the night. You can head to offtheball.com right now to register for tickets. Tickets are free, but you must register and show proof on the day either by printing tickets or having them downloaded on your smartphone. The event is for over 18s only. Visit drinkaware.ie and it's all a thanks to Bulmers and their Road to Goals campaign. Rory and Kenny, thanks a million for popping in this morning. Uh, just one more comment before we finish up. It's from Irish Gary One. And uh, after a chat with Will Fleury a little bit earlier on, he says, just had a vision of Kenny in the UFC ring. Kenny killing him softly. <laughs> I think you should being take that killed. up. <laughs> being beaten up what, what badly. You, How about Kenny being beaten up badly? <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you get into the UFC cage, no? <coughs> into the octagon? God, no. No. No, I haven't got a fighting bone in my body. I'm and passive, you know that. Um, yeah, well, I, Conversations, generally. You, you save all your daggers for your conversations. Verbally, <laughs> uh, maybe, but that's, a, that's about it. It's been a pleasure this morning. Thanks, many for coming in, lads. Uh, more coming up as well on Off the Ball tonight from 7 o'clock, and we're back as usual tomorrow morning from 7.45am on OTBAM. We'll chat to you then. Bye-bye for now.